staff service again, we will prelay a number, large number of wreaths on behalf of a number of organizations. Then we will have approximately 14 wreaths laid by people that represent the organizations that the wreaths represent. We're still working with Southwest Health to see if we can hold the silent walk. We're allowed a maximum of 100 people to an outdoor gathering, but we're trying to clarify because we do not know how many will be coming, whether we can exceed that number. We're going to encourage people that are attending the Cenotaph service on November the 11th to please wear a mask and practice social distancing as the guidelines by the health department are put down. And I'd also like to advise people that thank you to the town of Tilsonburg. They're going to live stream the service on the town of Tilsonburg Facebook page. Um, to make it a little easier for people to donate this year, we again have an e-transfer account that is all in lowercase, branch 153 poppy at yahoo.com. Anybody wishes to go to that website, uh, they can make a donation that way. And we also, for the first year, we have an experimental tap poppy box that will be available in the town center mall setting. Um, we will again be manning four different tables this year. We'll be at uh, Metro, Sobeys, Town Center Mall, and Zares daily from 11 to 4, as long as we have the volunteers uh, to man those tables. Poppies will also be available thanks to the gracious businesses and other people in the community that are allowing us to put poppy boxes out in their establishments. And uh, of course, I would like to personally thank all the members of the Tilsonburg area that donated to last year's poppy campaign that saw us raise in excess of $24,000 that we're using to support our veterans. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any questions? Uh, yeah, well, thank, first of all, thank you and, and through you to all the great work that uh, the local Legion continues to do. Um, I'll open up the floor to questions, but is there a contact uh, phone number for the Legion regarding potential volunteers? Yes, Mr. Mayor, if they'd like to call the Legion office, uh, it's open Monday to Friday from nine till noon. It's 519-842-5281. And if you call outside those hours, there's an answering machine and we'll be happy to return your call. Excellent. Uh, questions from members of council, please, for Mr. Burton. Seeing none, did you have anything else, uh, Mr. Burton? Yes, Mr. Mayor. At this time, it's my pleasure to present to you the first poppy of the 21 campaign. We rehearsed that. I, it's an honor, and I know that uh, um, the other members of council and our leadership team and right across the organization will be... Uh, uh, providing whatever support we can individually and collectively be doing. Um, I didn't see any additional questions. Are you getting, and I'm not talking about the individual response, but um, in your networking with Southwest Public Health, are you getting um, response, timely response, uh, uh, um, or is there any assistance you may need to, you know, to get the answers you're looking for? I, I believe we're getting the response needed. We're just the only one that we haven't got is that we can hold the silent walk. And once we get that clearance, we'll advise the public through the media and, and as well as on the uh, Town of Tilsonburg Facebook page. Okay, and I look forward to our communications team uh, helping uh, the, the Legion out uh, as much as possible with that. The only other thing, um, while well, Mr. Burton's here, um, uh, to members uh, of the Legion, Branch 153, I did have the both the pleasure and honor um, to uh, gather uh, responsibly with Zone B uh, representatives uh, of the Royal Canadian Legion as it was hosted uh, this year uh, in their regional 
uh, conference in Tilsonburg, and it was extremely well organized. It was uh, done uh, safely and, and the protocols, but uh, seeing uh, uh, the discussions and the representation from across the, the region was very impressive. So, any further uh, for Mr. Burton? Uh, Deputy Mayor, you have a resolution, please. I do. It's uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Parker. The council receives a presentation from Don Burton re re regarding the 2021 Poppy Campaign as information. Thank you, Deputy. Any further discussions? Well, um, as a longstanding Lion member, and, and the Deputy Mayor um, introduced that as well, uh, I know and I hope that uh, members of our community have been able to take advantage of the large poppy uh, lawn signs, which is uh, also a new and unique uh, um, opportunity in our community. So uh, thank the Lions Club as well for their uh, leadership in that. Mr. Mayor, could I speak to that? Oh, certainly. Thank you. Uh, at this point, the, the uh, lawn poppies have been a, a huge supported success from the people in Tilsonburg. Uh, the target was 3,000 lawn poppies and we're almost there as far as being sold out. And uh, as I stated earlier to members of council, the, uh, the proceeds are not to go to the Lions Club nor to the Legion, but strictly directly to the veteran uh, as do, do the poppies. And uh, uh, I think it's a good uh, system. So we're proud to say we don't have the exact numbers, but uh, uh, we're, we're going to be certainly in excess of $10,000 in a donation uh, to the Royal Canadian Legion uh, for their poppy fund from the 2020 cam 2021 campaign, uh, which will go on another year. Now, there are some left, and uh, in order to get some, there's some phone numbers out there. There's the Tilsonburg Lions Club website to contact or contact myself for those who know me. I have them, but they will be available at the Town Centre Mall at the, uh, uh, the north entrance by the CIBC uh, this weekend, Friday and Saturday, and they'll be for sale. They're three for 25. And as I said, the, uh, uh, we're close to sold out. So if you want them, get there, uh, get there early, please. So, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to that. And I thank you on behalf of the Lions Club for the hard work that the club has done on this. Excellent. Are there any further questions to the resolution? And we'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Resolution is carried. Uh, thanks very much again, Mr. Burton, and uh, good luck, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was my pleasure to be here in front of you people tonight. I appreciate the time. And I also do appreciate the effort that the Lions Club have put into their, their campaign. I know they've done a lot of work on behalf of the veterans, and I certainly appreciate it. Thank you very much and have a good night with the rest of your meeting. Thank you, sir. Um, as per our amended agenda resolution, we will move to item 8.1 on the agenda. Um, this is an application for zone change under the public meeting section of our agenda this evening. It's application ZN 7-21-13. It's an application to rezone lands on property at 31 Victoria Street from minor institutional to special low density residential R3 special to facilitate the development of an affordable housing project consisting of 18 dwelling units. The owner and applicant is the town of Tilsonburg nonprofit housing corporation. And it's Mr. Gilbert. Oh, there you are, sir. Um, welcome, Eric. Um, you have comment on the application, please. Thank you. Uh, as you noted, this is an application for zone change to rezone the property from a minor institutional zone to a special R3 zone. The proposed development is the redevelopment of the uh, existing or reuse of an existing vacant building that was formerly used as a place of worship and the proposed 12,000 square foot addition to the existing building, all one, uh, both one story in height. The subject property is about 1.6 acres. Uh, the area west of the existing building consists of ravine lands and is wooded, and the remaining area of the site is a paved parking area with uh, landscape planting strips uh, and a fenced boundary. Uh, in response to a call for proposals for affordable housing projects, 
the applicant proposes to reuse the existing building and construct the addition to create 18 dwelling units, uh, predominantly geared for seniors. Uh, staff have the opinion that the development will provide for more housing choice for residents of Tilsonburg and is considered to be an efficient use of the land, municipal services and infrastructure. Uh, as such, it is consistent with the provincial policy statement. The, the proposal also complies with a number of official plan policies that speak to the creation of housing opportunities uh, and affordable housing and proposals that uh, promote residential int intensification in appropriate locations. Uh, the official plan also recognizes the importance of increasing the supply of affordable housing within the town and directs that town council may consider the use of reduced infrastructure requirements and lot standards on a site specific basis to facilitate the delivery of affordable housing, provided that such measure continues to meet the overall objectives of the official plan. The property is designated low density residential, which permits um, a maximum of 12 units per acre. Uh, the, this proposal, uh, the proposed density would be 10.1 units per acre, which is within the maximum permitted density. As such, the proposal does comply with low density residential policies. And the conversion of the existing building uh, also complies with the, uh, the policies and official plan uh, respecting the reuse of existing uh, non-residential buildings. As the building uh, will not exceed three stories in height, it's located very close to an arterial road being Concession Street West, and will make use of the existing entrance and parking areas of the former place of worship. The proposal will be subject to site plan control, uh, where all, uh, all concerns regarding lot grading, drainage, parking, stormwater management uh, are resolved to the satisfaction of the town and county and the entire site is within the Long Point uh, Conservation Authority regulation limit. And as such, uh, the applicant will need a permit from them uh, to facilitate the proposed development. The only uh, relief of the R3 zone that's required in this case is the number of dwelling units. Uh, the R3 zone normally permits uh, one multiple unit dwelling consisting of four units. Uh, in this case, the applicant's requesting to permit 18 units. However, the site is large enough that uh, it does comply with all of the other required um, provisions, including lot area, uh, setbacks, and parking. And uh, it as noted, it will also be uh, compliant with the uh, minimum and maximum density for this area. Uh, in light of this, staff are of the opinion that the proposal is consistent with the official plan and recommend approval of the application. Thank you very much, Mr. Gilbert. Are there questions for the planner for members of council, please? The one uh, question I'd have uh, then uh, in the absence of other questions and not to prejudice um, a registered um, uh, speaker is will you um, be available in a few minutes time, Mr. Gilbert, to uh, have a bit of dialogue on the correspondence that was received from a neighbor dated the 6th of October? Yeah, I can speak to that. Okay, okay. well, I, I wanna give the individual their, their opportunity. So um, anything further from members of council, just recognizing that we are meeting under the Planning Act to, to deal with this zone change application ZN 721-13. If anyone who appeals this decision has not provided council with oral or written submissions at this public meeting or prior, then the local planning appeal tribunal has the power to dismiss the appeal. Um, now, uh, representing the Tilsmark Nonprofit Housing Corporation um, is uh, their general manager, Mr. Clarkson, is here, and I know a board member, um, uh, Ron Gasparetto. Uh, and then actually a, another member who may uh, pr um, be prepared to make comment as well. But um, did you go on my screen? Mr. Clarkson, are you prepared to make, oh, there you are, the, the screen moved, I apologize. 
Um, welcome, Mr. Clarkson. Did you have a comment to the application uh, as uh, made by uh, Tilsmer Nonprofit Housing? I do. Um, very brief. Uh, just first, thank you all for uh, giving us the time here to uh, consider our application. Um, you know, I know there's a couple of members of council that are on the affordable housing committee and are very aware of our, our situations in our, uh, our region here. Um, there's a tremendous need for affordable housing for uh, our most valuable or vulnerable populations. Um, and in our case, uh, senior citizens, 65 and over. Um, the need is real. Uh, as it stands today, we currently have an overall inventory in our three buildings of 159 units. Um, with that comes a wait list of currently over 420 names that are waiting to get into those 159 units. Um, this building in particular will be designated as an affordable housing project. Um, to drill down further on those numbers, uh, we currently have 40 units in our three buildings um, that are uh, designated as affordable housing. And for that list in particular, we have 80 names on the waiting list. Um, our tenants are, as I mentioned, seniors. Um, this is not transitional housing for them. This is their home. When they move in, they stay. Therefore, the, the turnover time on the wait lists, are, it, it's probably anywhere from four to seven years, depending on the type of unit that, uh, that they're looking for. Um, we've been a provider of nonprofit housing in Tilsonburg for uh, nearly 40 years. Uh, we have the experience. We have the experience uh, on a project very similar to this, uh, as most of you are familiar on 13 Sanders. Um, we have a committed board with good leadership and access to the financial means to complete the project to help uh, um, help these seniors uh, from our region attain clean, safe, and uh, affordable housing in uh, in our region. And uh, that's uh, that's what I have. Uh, for, thank you very much. Are there questions for the applicants? Uh, we'll start with Councillor Parker, please. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Michael. Um, thanks for coming to present today. Um, I think this is a great uh, opportunity to repurpose um, a building that's um, sitting vacant and has been for quite some time. Um, also, your other facilities that uh, are up cap are always in great shape um, with very few issues. Um, I just wanted to, there was a county RFP. I'm just wondering if uh, Tilsburg Nonprofit Housing applied and what the timeline is for that RFP um, to Oxford County. Uh, yes, um, thank you. We uh, we did um, complete the RFP process uh, and uh, have already submitted the documents to uh, Oxford County. Um, so I believe next month at County Council meeting is when they would actually be deciding. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor can probably uh, provide the date of the, the uh, actual meeting for the County Council. Um, at which point they will be deciding the uh, the recipients of the the uh, potential um, well it's 1.7 million dollars plus in order that could to be made available to help with this project should we be able to attain uh, uh, the zone change and move forward for fair consideration amongst the uh, competition. Thank you. Further question, Councillor Russell. Time, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and uh, a question for you, Michael, then. So you said, um, you know, 1.7 billion, is that the money, the gross amount of money that's available through the County of Oxford? Or is that the amount of money you're looking for for this project? Sorry, I caught the first half of your question. Do you mind? Okay, so I'm wondering if the 1.7 million then is the cost of this particular project or is, that the or is that the amount of money that's available through the county for multiple projects? That's the amount of money available through the county for uh, multiple projects. Oh. Uh, it'll be up to them to decide whether one particular group uh, receives all of the money or whether they divide it up amongst uh, any other potential uh, applicants. And the um, the estimated cost of this particular project then? The, the rough numbers that have come in so far uh, working with the uh, um, read and delay um, for uh, helping us with the costing process. 
uh, is in around the 3.4 to $3.6 million total budget. Wow. And where does that money come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully everything moves forward with this and 1.7 or so is covered by uh, uh, Oxford County through the funding. Mm -hmm. um, we are able to self-fund because we've actually been in uh, um, existence for as long as we have uh, at, at our uh, other locations. Um, we, we have lower costs with the age of our buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, of course, we have a long-standing relationship with CIBC who uh, in the private funding can come through for us. Uh, and then of course, CMHC also has some federal and provincial streams that we'll pursue as well. Perfect. So multiple sources. Then. Multiple sources available. Thank you very much. Any additional questions from members of council regarding the application for zone change? Did you have any supplemental comments uh, in a position as board member, Mr. Gasparetto? Thank you, Mayor Molnar. Uh, I think uh, Mike has done an excellent job of providing the information. Um, you know, I can I can add that. Uh, you know, we're we're very uh, we're very excited to uh, proceed with another project in the town of Tilsonburg and uh, providing further units uh, for our seniors in our fine community. Um, you know, we're very excited for the opportunity when when this building became available. Uh, it just checked all the boxes for us in terms of location and size and and um, and need uh, location to downtown and and other sort of resources. So we're we're just really excited to be able to continue in creating uh, affordable uh, housing stock within uh, within the town. Thank you. Further from council, that may be the the point that I would most like to pick up on. Um, to both uh, Mike and Ron is the affordable housing stock and the inventory. Um, Tilsonburg Nonprofit Housing Corporation, I'll not say exclusively, but uh, um, predominantly has been geared towards uh, senior living. Um, uh, Mr. Clarkson, um, I think quite eloquently explained uh, that these are homes, these are people's residents and, and um, that's the priority in, in uh, um, in getting uh, uh, that inventory so that it's available uh, for people. And uh, I think that's the real, you know, the story. This is a planning application, so I'm going to try to stay within the boundary. But within the report, well, it allows me to ask this. It did say predominantly geared for seniors. Now, that's in the planning report. Has Tilsonburg Nonprofit Housing Corporation, while doing a historically excellent job of providing safe and responsible, uh, reliable housing to primarily a senior population, ever been in a position to consider expanding your portfolio, especially through your management excellence, uh, to further demographics? Well, I can, through the mayor, um, I can say we, we haven't undertaken that study yet, um, but as we grow both as a board, um, I think that's something that, you know, uh, we can bring up to our board to see if, the, if uh, they want to expand our mandate uh, to include um, other age groups um, uh, within, within the town. So it's, it's certainly something to think of, but to answer your question, uh, we have been, 100% uh, senior living up until this point uh, in our 40 year history. Very good. It's a model that works. It may be extended to other areas. That's all I'm um, potentially, you know, uh, introducing. Uh, so uh, any further questions for the applicants? Um, we have one other registered speaker here this evening. It's a thank you very much. I would uh, recognize for the record that there was correspondence from uh, Richard Martin at 35 Victoria and uh, Richard's in attendance here this evening. So welcome, sir. And are you prepared to make comment? Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to get my video, how to get my camera started here, but uh, no matter. Um, I want to speak, one, as an immediate neighbor of 
Oh, thank you. Okay. Does that work? Okay, there we go. Okay. So welcome. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I'm probably as directly affected by this proposal as anybody in Tilsonburg, given that the subject property surrounds mine on two sides. Um, and on that basis, I want to speak in favor of the proposal in general. I'm certainly uh, in in uh, support of the overall objective. And uh, Mr. Clarkson's numbers about the backlog certainly got my attention. Uh, I do, however, have a, a few minor points that I would like to make suggestion regarding. Um, first off, uh, uh, I believe it was Mr. Clarkson made reference to the fact that the Long Point Region Conservation Authority is going to have to uh, make a, a decision or render approval or whatever um, in this regard. And uh, I spoke to them this morning. They are in receipt of uh, this proposal package, but they only got it this morning. So it will take them a little while to, uh, you know, analyze it, look at it, make whatever decision uh, they need to make uh, or they see fit. The, so as a result, I would suggest that any action that this council take today uh, include wording along the lines of subject to approval by Long Point Region Conservation Authority. Um, Second point that I'd like to, to make is that uh, it might make sense to ask for relief of one other item under the uh, zoning bylaw, still part of section 8.2. Um, the proposal asks for relief from a four unit maximum to an 18 unit number. Um, but I'd suggest it would also make sense to get relief while we're at it uh, on lot frontage. Uh, the bylaw calls in the case of a converted dwelling or uh, public use for 20 meters of lot frontage. And uh, it's, it's very possible that this property does have 20 meters of lot frontage, but by my measurement this morning, it was a lot closer to 18.8. I'd hate for that to become a sticking point moving forward. Um, and so uh, if council can uh, provide relief from the lot frontage uh, requirement maybe down to something like 18 meters, which is certainly sufficient for the, the intended use. Uh, it may uh, avoid problems down the road. Um, the third thing that I saw when I was reviewing this proposal was that there seems to be a certain imprecision in the spatial information that's presented here. And I think that's entirely appropriate at this early stage of any project. Um, you know, har hardly surprising. And uh, Mr. Clarkson has made reference to ongoing work being done by architects and, and construction companies and engineers and whatever. Uh, I'm sure that more precise numbers are available. But one of the, what struck me was that on, uh, page 59 of the agenda as it was distributed uh, via email. There's a sketch showing the existing building and an addition to the south of the existing building uh, and indicating clearly that the addition is going to be of at least roughly the same width uh, as the existing building. Yet the addition is described as being 12,000 square feet. And if you take the width of the existing building and extend it to effectively the, the southern border of the property, um, what you get is something on the order of 67 to 6,800 square feet, not 12,000. So, um, you know, it, maybe the addition will be wider, uh, although that would introduce a trade off between building space and parking spaces, um, you know. It's just, I would expect that this is gonna get addressed as 
plans for the site move forward. Um, but I'd just like to uh, alert council to the fact that right now the numbers are, are probably a little on the soft side, at least as presented here. Put this all together and what I would like to suggest in order that nothing hold up this proposal, I mean, Lord knows I don't want to get in the way of 1.7 million potential dollars. Um, you know, I would suggest that uh, rather than approve the proposal for 18, uh, 18 dwelling units, that that be reworded to something along the lines of a maximum of 18 or up to 18, so that a smaller number, should that turn out to be necessary or desirable, um, would would still be covered by the approval granted today. Um, normally, I wouldn't worry about stuff like that, but what I saw reading through the bylaw is that it's very precise. You know, uh, a duplex, a triplex, or a fourplex. Um, you know, so it, the numbers tend to be very precise rather than uh, just ranges. I think by having a uh, an up to or a maximum of language in there, it would approve not just 18 units, but also any smaller number of units than 18 should that prove necessary. Um, that's all, as I said, I, I want to see this go forward. Uh, it is a wonderful location for seniors, um, well over 65 myself. And, um, you know, it is, in fact, within reasonable walking distance of pretty much everything you need to get to in town, uh, and especially the hospital. So uh, that's all I have, uh, although I'll take any questions that anyone might come up with. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Mr. Barton. That was a, a lot of prejudice, anything from council, but it's extremely well thought out and presented. So are there questions for um, the uh, for Mr. Martin from members of council, please? Seeing none, this is going to maybe where I'm going to pull um, Mr. Gilbert back in. Um, relative to the comments, and suggestions that Mr. Martin has introduced. Um, making a lot of notes here. I guess the one was minimum lot frontage, although I'm using my ruler, but he lives right next door and is probably walking it. So um, the comments that Mr. Martin made in good faith, uh, do you have concerns relative to those? There's some um, site plan takes care of some of those. Um, and where does the overriding um, uh, approval process regarding the local conservation authority uh, play into this um, as per the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, with respect to the lot frontage, um, I did look at this. There was a survey completed in February of this year. And according to the legal survey, there is at least 20 meters of frontage. So that's why it wasn't included in the the bylaw, the uh, 18 units, the bylaw, you know, could be modified to include up to 18 units. Um, I think the bylaw has a maximum, we could include it to be a maximum number. Um, we didn't because the applicant was fairly certain that that was the number that um, they're proceeding with. Um, the Conservation Authority did provide comments uh, today at 5.30. Um, just indicating that uh, they'll require a geotechnical report uh, as part of their uh, permit application. So their permit application, it is a separate process and the town does require a permit from the conservation authority to be issued uh, prior to the town issuing any building permits. Um, so their, their concerns and requirements uh, will have to be addressed um, in either case. And the applicant, I think some of the roughness and some of the sketches provided were uh, just due to the tight timeline of this application. Um, it was just submitted in beginning of September and uh, staff knowing the uh, tight timelines and the funding deadlines uh, did our best to expedite it to this meeting. So um, there may be more details at the site point stage than normal to be worked out, uh, but they all will be uh, resolved as, uh, through that process. Uh, 
uh, as much as confirmation than um, the material information that Mr. Martin introduced. Um, uh, there's an understanding from the planning department on those. I think you commented on the a lot frontage, so you've got confirmation of that. LPRCA is a building permit stage. This is a zone change application, but their actual construction couldn't take place beyond that um, without that. Um, and I don't, I'm, I'm not in a position to individually comment on the up to 18. I just want to be very fair and at least transparent to Mr. Martin is because uh, uh, while we're dealing with a zone change, there's a business model that goes into um, housing and, and in particular, actually affordable housing. Um, and if uh, that uh, needs to be recognized in by the applicants, you know, they're, they're building 18, they're not building 24, they're not building 16. But um, I think it's a, a valuable comment. I just hope the planners have, have also heard the comments from Mr. Martin. Did you have any summary? We're still really um, with your opportunity, Mr. Martin. I just wanted to get some clarity from Mr. Gilbert, both regarding your comments tonight and your communication of the 6th of October. So did you have anything final? Um, no, that's, that's, that's pretty much the, the sum of it. Uh, I do, uh, however, uh, want to direct council's attention to the written communication that I submitted earlier. Um, the, the fact of the matter on this property is that, uh, for, I think it's five adjacent homeowners, uh, there is fencing that's been in place for decades. Um, which does not actually sit on the legal boundary of the property. Um, and uh, as a result, at some point in time, I would hope that, uh, you know, this can be, can be rationalized uh, so that it's simpler for everybody. Um, right now, for instance, uh, on my property, the, the owner, in this case, the, the nonprofit housing corporation, is probably responsible for mowing some grass that they can't easily get to. I mean, it's, it's silly, but it's true. Um, and there are neighbors of mine who have trees uh, hanging over their eaves, which the trunk seems to be on their lot, but in legal terms, it's actually not. Um, so I do think that there's uh, potential for mm, niggling little issues down the road, uh, which could be easily avoided if at some point in time we can rationalize the, the property boundaries. But I don't, I don't want to imply at all that that has to happen at this stage of the process. Okay, hey, very good. Uh, any final questions for members of council? I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, it's on the record and it's probably something that the, the housing corporation from their capacity could also look at for, for that to, you know, whatever benefit, uh, mutual benefit in that area. So um, anything further? Councillor Esseltine, do you have a resolution, please? Thank you, I do, Mr. Mayor. Um, given that uh, Mr. Gilbert and yourself have addressed some of the comments from Mr. Martin, I'm gonna read the um, motion as it appears in the agenda package. So uh, moved by myself, uh, seconded by Deputy Mayor, Maris, uh, Deputy Mayor Barris, that council approved the zone change application submitted by Town of Tilsonburg Nonprofit Housing Corporation, whereby the lands described as lots 688, part lots 687, 689, and 715, plan 500, known municipally as 31 Victoria Street, are to be rezoned from minor institutional zone IN1 to special low density residential type three zone R3-SP to facilitate the development of an affordable housing project consisting of 18 dwelling units. Thank you. 
Excuse me. Thank you, Councillor Esseltine. Discussion from members of council to the resolution. Seeing none, I'm prepared to call that question. All those in favor? Opposed? That resolution is carried. Now, council has now approved zone change application ZN7-21-13. A bylaw will be brought forward later on tonight's agenda and then there will be a 20 day appeal period. Once again, thank you and uh, to the applicant, good luck. And to um, the neighbor, um, thank you very much for, for your comments. Uh, um, we'll continue with the agenda in the order as amended and i believe we're moving to a presentation or delegation presentation from uh, uh fabric uh architects uh, the town hall space needs study um as uh, and haley gamble haley welcome back uh, just uh, notice uh, uh, all the, both the uh, presenter uh, here and the other delegations have been uh, notified of the appropriate uh, time frames uh, uh, for their presentations and then the opportunity for council to ask questions. So welcome, Haley. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, okay, yeah, so I'll dive right in. Uh, call the presentation here. Can everyone see my presentation just fine? Great. Okay, uh, so I'm here to speak briefly about Fabric Architects upgraded space needs study for uh, an upgraded town hall. Um, so uh, just to go over briefly what my presentation order is going to be, I'm going to give a summary of our work and the study we've been working on, um, uh, some survey results that have been conducted, an analysis of sort of the existing condition of the town hall and the town facilities, and then go into a spa our space needs analysis followed by some considerations about site design and selection and basis for interior design, accessibility, and then finally to discuss a bit about next steps. So in summary, Fabric Architects was contracted this year to uh, review and upgrade a space needs study originally conducted by KNY Architects in 2016. Um, and essentially the purpose of this reevaluation was to sort of consider what the space needs might be and how they might have changed in light of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the resultant sort of changes to the workplace and how those might reflect in terms of the total amount of space required and also potential uh, cost implications. Um, so over the course of our study, uh, we have looked at three different sites, uh, and those sites are the existing location at 200 Broadway, uh, the customer service center at 10 Lisgar Street, and then a uh, Greenfield uh, municipal parking lots uh, at the corner of Harvey and Brock Streets. Uh, so we uh, site analyzed those and uh, also conducted, uh, as I say, an analysis of sort of the space required uh, for the various different uh administrative departments for the town. And also uh, we did this study alongside uh, a, a, another feasibility study that we conducted for operations. Uh, we've presented that at the last council meeting, but looking at 20 Spruce Street and opportunities there to uh, upgrade their space. Um, so these two projects together kind of uh, we consider them as operating sort of in tandem and both of them are following the same intent of consolidating some of the town's departments into more sort of efficient discrete buildings that each serve spe specific functions administrative versus operations uh, so it's sort of a bigger uh, strategy uh, at the town level that we're looking at the feasibility of. Uh, so when looking at the space needs for a new town on hall, we were considering that there are 57 current employees that would need to be housed there and five potential future admin uh, staff. And we also are recommending that the proposed facilities be designed for a further 10% increase in staff to allow for projected growth. And so, yes, this is just diving further into sort of those three sites that, um, well, the two sites that we are 
we're already looking at for potentially upgraded town hall and also the 20 Spruce Street site, which we evaluated in our other feasibility study. So starting point of our upgraded sort of space needs analysis uh, was these survey results that were conducted by the town hall steering committee, which were uh, surveying or interviewing all of the uh, all of the employees of the town for what their sort of perspectives are on a uh, hybrid work from home model and sort of the requirements for workspace in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so in this case, we looked specifically at the administrative staff and sort of their response. Um, but as a general takeaway, the uh, majority, the vast majority of staff are able to work from home and most would be amenable to some sort of flexible shared workspace, whether that's through hoteling or hot desking um, or dedicated sort of individual workstations that are shared. Um, and then beyond that kind of initial takeaway of the sort of ability or interest in working in a hybrid work from home model or shared workspace, um, we kind of also looked at what are the biggest advantages or disadvantages perceived by staff. And the biggest advantage or perceived advantage of a hybrid work from home model was a decrease in distractions. And the biggest perceived disadvantage was social isolation. So these were two things we sort of took into consideration of um, what we would need to accommodate for, what we need to be accommodated for in a hybrid work from home model. And so from here, we actually went into our space needs analysis and we did two different space needs uh, sort of evaluations based on two sets of assumptions. So this first one is based on a maximum flexibility scenario where the entire intention is to be able to accommodate as many uh, sort of individuals and program types as might be needed in the future. Um, and uh, the sort of resulting um, area required for that is 22,500 square feet. Um, also, I wanna note on these uh, spreadsheets, the titles that are highlighted in blue are titles that were not a part of the original 2016 study, whether that was because of hiring or because there was not an intention to have those particular positions be housed in a new town hall. Um, so that, right, that represents a, sort of a substantial increase in uh, sort of the number of individuals that would be housed in uh, an upgraded town hall facility. Um, and then in addition to that, in this upgraded town hall, we're accounting for uh, sort of the office of the CEO and council, uh, the economic development department, corporate services slash clerk, uh, building planning and bylaw, finance, recreation, culture and parks and operation services. And as I say, all, all of those departments together in a maximum flexibility scenario, uh, which is sort of providing more private offices and more individual workspaces would result in a need of 22,500 square feet and 23,010 square feet if uh, hydro were to be accommodated within this space as opposed to 20 Spruce Street, but we have accounted for that in our other feasibility study as well. Um, and just to note here, there's also, we've allowed a provision here for the Chamber of Commerce and the BIA. Um, so that's something that should be pursued in any further uh, conversation going forward is sort of uh, their interest in this space and sort of uh, the amount of space that they might require going forward. And then our second uh, space needs analysis was based on optimized floor plate. And in this uh, scenario or these numbers, there's an assumption that there would be a fully integrated uh, hybrid work from home model, which would allow um, the majority of workspace to be shared in some way, whether as I say, that's through hoteling or hot desking or even shared offices. Um, and in this scenario, it results in a requirement of 15,265 square feet. Um, so this, that's a substantial reduction from the, both the original report and a substantial reduction from the maximum flexibility scenario, um, which is based on sort of, a, as I say, the sharing of workspace and also sort of a reduction in the requirement um, in the sort of space needs for some of the common spaces and sort of some reconsiderations of that. 
And then sort of diving into the site design and selection a little bit further, um, we looked at three sites, as I've indicated, which are shown here on this plan, um, both the uh, existing space at 200 Broadway, 10 Lisgar, and then this parking, these parking lots. Um, and we discussed sort of what some of the pros and cons are of each of these sites. Um, so Broadway, where uh, you're currently located, uh, is will be a tenant fit out. Um, it allows for the most sort of aggressive timeline and potentially the lowest costs making use of this existing space um, and maintaining sort of a, a, a already familiar kind of location within the town and maintaining a good relationship with the landlord. It also allows for this for potential sale of other properties if that's desired. Um, there are limits though to layout and area and it sort of inhibits the creation of a clear autonomous uh, town hall and potentially limits the project scope. Um, 10 Lisbar Avenue makes use again of existing town owned space. Uh, the existing building is the, right about the correct size to be able to house the upgraded town hall. Um, there wouldn't be any rent or further uh, site development costs. Um, it's already all continuous single story, um, but this would require sort of some reworks. Uh, there might be limited opportunity for future growth on this site and sort of a potentially tight timeline. And then this is followed by the Greenfield site, which um, on one hand allows you to sort of develop an upgraded town hall in um, with lots of flexibility and lots of opportunity to sort of uh, increase the size over time. But this also would come with potentially the highest costs and timeline. Um, so we also did a uh, sort of analysis of the potentials for the interior design based on responses to the pandemic and this hybrid work from home model. Um, I'm not going to get into these in too much detail, but we basically went by each um, sort of general work type space and looked at some of the opportunities to sort of improve their use in a way that's safe and allows more users to use them, but as I say, in a sort of safe or socially distanced way. Um, so for example, we looked at the reception and the the idea of having separate entries for visitors versus staff um, and then having uh, sort of uh, kind of clearly as I say separated program areas like for waiting versus um, entry. Uh, we also spent a uh, credit of time looking at um, sort of the reworking of office space both at the sort of uh, open office level and or workstation level and the private office level and ways that uh, you could better share this space, um, for example, by sort of uh, separating uh, individual workstations and putting sort of storage or um, small sort of uh, socially distanced collaboration spaces in between or creating more storage space for employees so that they would have their own private storage space but would be able to uh, share on different days like the same work surface. Um, we also took a look at meeting spaces and specifically uh, for um, the looked at council chambers and how we could kind of reconsider that and kind of make that floor plate smaller but still allow sort of one side of the space to be able to open up onto a public circulation corridor in order to really make uh, multiple use of the space and um, allow uh, sort of the capacity that's required but also um, most efficient or optimized with the space. Um, we looked at common spaces as well. And again, this idea of sort of having separate entries and exits into spaces um, or sort of breaking up common spaces into smaller multiple spaces in order to sort of minimize contact. And then we just have a sort of a brief overlook at how all the spaces might work together. Um, and then this is followed by sort of some considerations in terms of accessibility. Uh, this is particularly a sort of timely or relevant. Currently, um, equity is very important in general, but especially for any sort of um, municipality uh, or uh, town hall. Um, and so we just wanted to kind of call that to attention and say that it's uh, not only do you want to follow sort of best practice for accessibility, but it would be ideal to try and, I guess, transcend that. Um, so that's just not, not just in terms of physical accessibility, but also in terms of perceived accessibility and um, the sense that sort of any constituent would feel comfortable coming into the building and any constituent would be able to use it. Um, so that was sort of the other consideration in the feasibility study. So speaking to next steps, sort of uh, what we've been working on thus far has been this feasibility study, which is sort of looking at 
uh, potential sites, uh, their pros and cons, um, what sort of things might need to be considered uh, in terms of the interiors, uh, how much space might be required based on different sets of assumptions. Uh, but going forward, the sort of recommendation would be to kind of go into the staged process that building sort of would go through from schematic design through to uh, construction administration. And um, the timeline on this may vary depending on what site is selected or the scope of work, um, but that would sort of be the process. Um, also, like we would recommend uh, that a site uh, be selected as that um, largely dictates um, things like costs, the amount of space that's available and the sort of potential for development. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Shaley. Are there questions for the presentation? Um, as uh, Haley introduced, uh, Councillor Gavazzi, please. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor to Haley. At what point, so you presented uh, three different options and then um, there actually was uh, another space needs study last week that we saw a presentation on, but when, what point in time should there be a selection of an option? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, from, from our perspective, I would say the sooner is probably the better um, because you can end up, I guess, devoting quite a lot of time or resources into researching multiple options. Um, it's, I mean, it's just dependent on if there's anything that um, council feels has not yet been evaluated with what is here, but generally the sooner you get into that process, um, the sooner you can get, well, the sooner you end up with a town, with, with uh, sort of the facilities that you require. Um, and also it usually helps to minimize costs on the project longer term because ultimately, you know, inflation is going to increase costs generally over time. Um, so from our perspective, it's sort of like the site really governs everything in a project. So the sooner you can, um, the sooner you can select one, uh, generally the more beneficial it is to the process. Or Deputy Mayor, sorry, uh, Deputy Mayor Barris, please. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, to uh, Haley, a couple of things when I read through this that uh, I'd like to do a little more investigation on. First of all, as far as site uh, uh, selection, where it might be, uh, your option C, uh, there is some area in there of former landfill site. We may have some difficulties with, uh, you know, geotech reports to see where it's allowed to be uh, because your sketch map is probably um, in an area that uh, wouldn't be allowed, but uh, it's roughly in that section of town. That's one comment that I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. um, another comment I wanted to make was uh, on uh, option A, which is at the town center mall. Something that you didn't say as a pro was that it does attract uh, people to the downtown core for shopping. Um, Tilsburg is proud to say that uh, their major retail is in the downtown core. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's, it's a major anchor to have the town hall at that particular location because it does draw a lot of people there to do business uh, from the public. And, um, uh, and of course, they would, uh, the mall people would be very happy because chances are they'll do a little shopping before they leave. The third item I wanted to make was your basis for interior design, your overall floor plan. Something that you have to keep in mind, you've got council chambers there with very little in the terms of gallery. Uh, councils have to, or should have uh, a larger area for people to assemble. If there's a, a town hall uh, issue that has to be met, there has to be seating and not people standing in the hallway. Um, those things certainly have to be dealt with wherever site uh, is chosen. Um, those, that, is, that is a must to have a significant amount of seating, comfortable seating for people in the gallery to, uh, uh, to come and make presentations and watch the, uh, the actions of council. Those are my comments. I don't think I, uh, I'm really looking for an answer on any of those. It's just something that I'd like you to put in your notes and make the amendments because I think they're all quite valuable. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, I can I can briefly um, address those. Just um, yes, noted about council chambers, of course. Um, that was more a representational diagram showing many spaces all at once. So it was more about 
sort of showing the potentials of how those things could sort of exist next to each other, but definitely the intention or the there's a very clear understanding that that would be a requirement that there is that um, that sort of space that would be needed. Um, Yes, and uh, yes, I was also aware about this former landfill. Um, my understanding is that it's partially on that site and partially outside of it, um, but that's something that I could uh, sort of incorporate into the report for sure. And yes, regarding the 200 Broadway location, um, yes, also definitely noted. I would say there's definitely a lot of strong interest um, from uh, sort of various uh, sort of entities or individuals in it staying in that location um, for those types of reasons. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to comment then, Haley, you gave us some like uh, some um, cost um, information or some cost uh, the variables, and uh, I just wanted to comment that those would be the initial costs to, um, in all likelihood, to uh, get a town hall set up and and going. But in there is also a longer term cost, and I think um, that what's most expensive changes when you look at the cost over twenty years and such. So I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, we. Are there questions from? Oh. Did Oh, yeah, I was just needs. I was just gonna say that we have indicated in locations where costs are recurring, for example, rent versus um if it's an upfront sort of a owned or purchased land. Um so yes, that's but operational costs are yeah an important consideration going forward. Oh, very good. Further questions from members of council? There's a resolution to deal with as well. Um No, I think more to do. Um, so did you have any summary comments, uh, Haley, regarding the presentation? Um, I think just all I would say is that currently the town's administrative staff operate over sort of several disparate suites and buildings across town that lack a kind of cohesive identity. Uh, furthermore, many of the existing spaces are sort of either inefficient, not very functional, or potentially poorly located. Uh, therefore, we see there's a clear need to sort of reevaluate how to consolidate uh, these administrative programs into one functional facility um, with a clear municipal identity and with special consideration for the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so yeah, we see there's a kind of a clear need and that there's a clear sort of uh, potential here or opportunity. Okay, and I should have asked because now you've reintroduced it. And, and you know, this originally was about uh, centralizing governance and uh, operational efficiencies, which you've kind of, I say it in one phrase, you've kind of highlighted eloquently um, the rationale for this uh, in large part. But you just referenced one building, and yet within the time frame of two council meetings, you've made a report on two separate issues, um, 20 Spruce Street and then the town, uh, a town hall. Have you yet had the capacity to kind of fundamentally bring those two processes together? Yeah, um, I would say uh, sort of our assumption was um, and rationale was having facilities be completely dedicated to sort of one type of function or operations. Um, we see that there's a strong sort of logic or argument to having an administrative facility and then an operational facility. Um, could those two things potentially be located in one location? Maybe. Um, as of now, the sites that we know of that are available for consideration for either type of site would not be well suited to having both in one place. Um, but we definitely see the two as operating in relation to each other and um, have definitely uh, tried to address that in the report, so. Thank you. Um, we will move to, there's a resolution attached. Uh, da, 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 Councillor Esseltine, you have that resolution, please? 
No, I think it's me, Mr. Mayor. Oh, updated town. report 21 down. Oh, we, we probably need to receive. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, and then we are moving as per our amended agenda. Councillor Parker, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Luciani, that the presentation from Fabric Architects regarding town hall space needs study be received as information, and that this information be referred to item 14.1.1 staff report CAO 21 13 for consideration. Okay. Ahead of me. Um, to the resolution, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Resolutions carried. As per the direction uh, approved uh, from that motion from Councillor Parker, we will advance ourselves now to item 14.1.1 CAO report 21 13, updated town hall space needs study. Now, Councillor Esseltine, you have a resolution. I do, Mr. Mayor. I'll move by myself, seconded by Councillor Parker, that Council receives report CAO 21-13, updated town hall space needs study, and that the updated Tussenberg town hall space needs review as prepared by Fabric Architects be used as a guiding document for the next phase of the process, namely the preparation of a site feasibility analysis and space design options in conjunction with the town hall steering committee. Thanks very much, Councillor Esseltine. Um, the author of the report is CAO Pratt uh, in attendance. Prior to uh, answering any questions, uh, Mr. Pratt, did you have summary comments on the report? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, through yourself to the rest of Council. So in summary, it was important today that we brought the space needs study and this report to Council to provide them an update where the committee is at to date. Uh, so since this was last in front of Council, uh, the landscape has changed, as you know, with COVID-19. As Haley noted, the hybrid work system, uh, we've done a study now on the operations and some possible efficiencies there. And we reintroduced a new site in the town uh, center mall. So there's, there's three sites that we're looking at. We wanted to bring this in front of councils to make sure you guys are okay with the path that we're on and our next steps and get your blessing uh, on those next steps so we can move forward. Uh, so to date, uh, there's been a survey by staff that the town hall committee has looked at. There's the updated space needs study in front of you today. And we're moving forward uh, with RFP uh, 20108, which is the site feasibility analysis and space designs. Uh, the site feasibility analysis will involve the preparation of conceptual designs for the three locations that we just noted. Uh, the development of these conceptual designs will allow a lot of the due diligence to be conducted regarding the suitability, functionality, servability, and those of the various sites uh, for the new town hall. So similar to the question that the deputy uh, mayor noted, uh, you know, can we build at that location? So this part uh, will answer, this part of the analysis will answer that. Uh, once this analysis is completed, a recommendation on the preferred location will be developed in conjunction with the town hall steering committee and brought forward to you, council, for your consideration. This is a critical step as it will guide the town's specific path forward uh, to the point uh, where a recommendation will be made and we can move forward. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Pratt. Uh, questions for the CAO and to the resolution that's on the floor. Councillor Govese, please. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the CAO. So in your report on page 81, it says the next phase of the town hall project is to complete a location site feasibility analysis, including design options and space design for the selected location. But you said that this, the space design and the feasibility anal analysis will be coming forward for all three locations. Is that correct? It will be created for all three locations uh, and the town hall committee, the committee you delegated with the authority to look into this, will be looking at those and they will make a recommendation to council. Let me continue through you, Mr. Mayor, to the CAO. And how is and when is the study that we saw last week for the works department going to be tied into this? Uh, this will be tied uh, through yourself, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councilor Gavese. So once these um, renders and uh, feasibility analysis are completed, the Town Hall Committee 
we'll uh, talk about how that ties into uh, these the new town hall. Of course, cost is going to be a major factor. Uh, there's some options in there. Uh, there's having um, the location at the town center mall. As noted here and last time, uh, the customer service center wasn't noted as a option for the new town hall, but now if, if council wants to move forward with the um, operation spades knee study uh, and, and go forward on that note, the customer service center would be an option. So just be renovations there. So the town hall committee will make a recommendation on where they want to go and uh, council will need to consider on their own merits, the feasibility regarding the operations. So if I may continue, Mr. Mayor, through you to the CAO. So once these three, um, the design study and analysis is done on all three, it goes to the committee. The committee is gonna recommend one option to council, but will council have the opportunity to view all the options? Through the mayor, Councilor Gavese, Right now, that is the process that I'm envisioning uh, with staff and the town hall committee. Uh, usually when we when recommendations are made to council, there are options. Uh, the report hasn't been written yet, so I don't I can't confirm that that's going to be the case. Um, I have another question through you, Mr. Mayor, to the CAO. So the funding is through the modernization strategy. Um, is there a timeline to use that funding? And I'm I'm going to explain a bit. Um, my rationale on asking this question. Um, I feel like the, wa the waters are muddy. We have so we have two different space needs. Now we've got three options. There's a space need study that's going to be done on the um, fire hall, I believe, moving forward. Um, I feel like there's a lot going on, and I feel like we have a piece here and a piece here but it's not necessarily cohesive. And like, I almost feel like we need a workshop just to go through all of this um, because I find it, I guess I find it a bit overwhelming and I'm not overwhelmed very often, but I just feel like there's a lot going on. Um, we've brought the customer service into the mix, which I mean, I think that there could have potential there, but then on the other hand, we just spent $450,000 doing the facade. Um, I don't, I don't want mistakes like that to happen again, moving forward, that we're going to move forward with something. And then, you know, five years down the road, then here we are. Um, so I, I have major concerns about even any of this moving forward at this point. Uh, to the mayor, to Councilor yeah. Gabezi. Yeah. So to answer your specific question, um, what are the timelines on this? So the space needs study uh, that was presented to council today will also be funded by the modernization funding uh, through the Ontario government. And the next RFP, that process is also funded by the Ontario government with the modernization funding. Uh, that is due, a report is due and should be finalized uh, by the province by January 31st of 2022. Uh, to go back, uh, that was your specific question, so that will uh, be completed by January 31st. Uh, to tie in, to make comment on some of your comments there, you know, the Operations based in the study, when I first came on board in January of 2020, that was already being talked about amongst the senior leadership team. So that was, you know, something that was being discussed amongst the team members. Uh, Carlos moved forward with that, presented to council. Council has no obligation to move forward with that, but presenting the needs and the requirements. Uh, we have sat through some budget meetings where a member on our council has noted some concerns with the fire hall and wants it to be looked at. So Count staff um, through council's wisdom and guidance uh, is looking to get the right funding to the province to pay for that study. So it's, it's uh, not necessarily coming from Tilsonburg taxpayers to their property tax. But those are things uh, that, like the fire hall that you're wanting us to look at. So we're happy to look at that. Whether we move forward or not, it's up to council. Thank you. Council report the resolution that is on the floor. Anything? I guess. I, uh, um, 
we're asking a lot of the committee as well, and they've been in involved for a while. I'll be consistent in my concern relative to the Spruce Street. You know, I think that's not what the expectation was in the 2019 business plan, but we've got the information, we own it, and it should be, we should be using it in some capacity. Um, the resolution as on the floor reads, be, and I'm just quoting the, the, what to me is the key part of this, be used as a guiding document for the next phase. So through to Mr. Pratt, that's what this is. There's, we're not endorsing anything other than this will be used as a guiding document, the, the fabric information to further the discussions and dialogues that are required to take place so that we get to that, you know, um, destination of, of understanding what the best decision is. Yes, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. Um, as noted uh, in front of you in 2019 uh, was a recommendation to move forward and there were certain locations that was look, that were looked at. Uh, you've tasked staff to look at other locations including the town center mall. We've done that now. Uh, we're proposing and noting three locations that we're looking at. Uh, we're doing a check-in with council right now to make sure that that's meeting your needs and expectations because if not, we would like to know now before we move forward. We don't want to prolong this in any way. We want to move forward with this as well, but we're doing our due diligence to make sure it's gonna be done right. Thank you. Further, and we'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Not resolutions carried. I need people to raise their hand though, but I had four, so. Um, we will continue with the agenda and we're going to go back now to delegations and it's a pleasure to welcome back, welcome back to chamber, um, welcome back to the, um, agenda representing the, um, uh, craft guild or the station arts center. Um, the president, Gail Connor. And uh, Gail, you have a presentation. You are, there you are. How are you I doing? I am. Thank Welcome. you very much. Uh, I'm very fortunate. Amelia is going to help me with the slide portion of, uh, of my presentation. Uh, and thank you, Amelia. No, excellent. Thank Council's had a chance to review it and there's some really good, exciting information in it. So thank you. Well, um, you go ahead, Gail. Thank you very much, Mayor Molner, councillors and town staff. It has been three years since I came before council and what a challenge those years have, <clears throat> excuse me, have been. It started with the loss of the basement due to facility issues and then rolled right into COVID-19. Our mission continues to be promote the arts in the community and our vision to arts, culture, community, and heritage. We do not exist without the support of a dedicated, amazing staff, <clears throat> excuse me, a dedicated board of directors, the town of Telsaburg, a volunteer base, local businesses, and organizations. We only exist and grow because they believe in who we are and what we do. Tabitha Verbist is our program community coordinator curator who leads this team. Her education in arts business management and dedication to nonprofit assist her in bringing creative programming to our community for all to enjoy. Her drive to collaborate with local organizations and artists continues to bring exciting exhibits to our gallery spaces and new opportunities for the station to participate in. Being an artist herself assists with relationship building in the arts community. She started as a co-op student at the station many years ago, and we are extremely fortunate to have her head the station forward. Autumn Simes is our administrative assistant. Autumn coordinates daily operations schedules meetings, provides customer service, manages inventory, handles finances, 
and works with the Sailing Association to schedule e-waste exchanges. Her dedication and drive to nonprofit and education in fine art continues to help propel the station forward. Megan Cauley is our station staff aide. Megan takes care of the station on Fridays and Saturdays. Her education in arts and entrepreneurial studies assists Tabitha in creative marketing and promotion for the gallery. Megan also assists and interacts with the Tilsonburg Farmers Market with outreach and promotion. Her dedication to provide a pleasant experience for visitors is apparent with her positive and welcoming attitude. All of our staff are very valuable to us and go the extra mile to ensure the success of the station. In the past, we have partnered with community groups, agencies, and the town with things like the Creative Imagination Festival, which has been part of Turtle Fest, uh, in the community, Beyond the Garden Gate Tours, Holiday Tour of Homes, Holiday Arts Market, Help Portrait, Woodstock Art Galleries, Visual Elements 360, Oxford County Events, and more. COVID-19 has certainly taken its toll on partnership events, but we are building relationships in other ways. Tabitha Verbist has been communicating and working with Tourism Oxford, Oxford Creative Connections, and the town's own BIA. We have been very grateful for their help and support during these unprecedented times. We saw 27,695 people in, through our facility in 2018, 19,000 in 2019, a whopping 6,150 in 2020, and currently 10,443. So this is one area where we got hit pretty hard. Uh, we were unable to hold March break camps in 2019 and 2020, and we were unable to hold art and craft camps in the summer of 2020. Numerous workshops and programs were canceled and exhibits in the Pat Node Family Gallery went virtual or were canceled due to artist COVID concerns. We were granted use of our building in 1982. Since that time, we have done many upgrades to the building we continue to maintain the look of the interior of the facility while the building updates, et cetera, have reverted to town responsibility. For this, we are extremely grateful. We will continue to ensure your facility shows to its best advantage. We do invite any and all councillors to visit us for a more in-depth tour of the historic facility. I encourage you to like our Facebook page and keep abreast of the many things happening at the station. We invite you to our openings uh, in our Pat Node Family Gallery for the exhibits. Come and meet the talented artists from our area. And we're hoping to be able to hold uh, more of those uh, now that some of the COVID-19 restrictions are slowly um, being eliminated. I come with a proposed agreement known as the Memorandum of Understanding, which more clearly shows the two facets of this partnership with the town. It speaks to both arts and culture and tourism. The station can and has affected changes for the better in our community through the relationship, this relationship and these initiatives. We are asking for a three-year term commitment we are respectfully requesting an operational increase to 52,000 for 2022 and ask that 2023 and 2024 be indexed to inflation. With the challenges of the last two to three years, we ask for this assistance to help us recover financially. We are a hardworking organization that tries and succeeds in being as self-sufficient as we can, but like many others, the COVID years have taken its toll on this. Financial statements are provided to you annually through our, uh, our liaison, which is Chris Baird. It should be noted that we have converted to audited financial statements for fiscal 2020-2021. With this change, our financial status shows a little differently. The bottom line shows we are in good shape. However, we were approved loans through the Canada Emergency Business Account and received full benefits. 
40,000 of that will be paid back by December, 2022. This money is in reserve and is ready for the for repayment. Also, our staff hours were cut by 50% and they qualify for child care benefits for the other half. This shows wages considerably smaller than previous years. Having said this, if you apply the repayment of the loan and consider that our salaries will revert to the usual this year, we need help. Our amazing staff have worked very hard during the lockdowns to ensure that the Station Arts Centre is visible to in the community. They have provided craft bags for home use, virtual exhibits, features on baggage room gift shop vendors, etc. Our presence through social media has grown by leaps and bounds. Going forward, our staff is working behind the scenes to create new online initiatives for easier browsing and shopping of our galleries and baggage room. Things to look forward to are online programs, new events involving our in-house groups, pop-up exhibits, ever-growing and changing programs for all ages, and continued community involve involvement in a multitude of ways. Upcoming programming is quite extensive and keeping things organized and running smoothly is crucial. Ongoing restrictions and protocols continue to challenge this area as well. While we have use of the basement again, our class size is hampered by protocols and room dimensions. In-house groups are reorganizing after a lengthy hiatus, and it is our hope that they will grow along with us. Current circumstances also challenge the ability to rent our space as another source of income. We hope to be able to offer areas up for music venues, birthday parties, and family gatherings. And the newer um, uh, OVID um, uh, details that have just come out from Premier Ford are going to perhaps help us in the coming months now with, uh, with limitations. Of course, with the youth programming, we're still going to be limited because none of those uh, are vaccinated. They are under 12 years of age. <clears throat> so hopefully we're moving forward there. Our e-waste program also provides a stream of income and we are trying to maximize this. Income is split 50-50 between us and our partnership with the Tilsonburg Sailing Association, who also provide manpower to look after the bin. We continue to be successful in redirecting e-waste and keeping it out of landfill sites. From 2014 to 2017, we redirected over a million pounds of e-waste. And for councillors who don't know, we were awarded the Tilsonburg Chamber of Commerce Environmental Award in 2017. During the three years of the previous MOU, we successfully redirected a further 791,000 pounds of e-waste. A bin is filled and replaced bi-weekly. Each filled bin averages roughly 4,000 pounds. The bin is now located across from the caboose on Bridge Street West. We are extremely appreciative of our community for the continued support of this initiative. We work very hard to give back fair value for the assistance you graciously provide to us. We appreciate and enjoy our partnership with the town. We want to see Tilsonburg grow culturally and to be a platform to help with that. A previous president made a comment that has always resonated with me. He said, while the station isn't an essential service to the town like the fire, police, ambulance or the hospital. It is an essential service for improving the quality of life for the citizens of our town and promoting the highest standards of community service and accessibility to the world at our doorstep. This is so relevant to the station today. I believe the station and what it does and can do takes this very much to heart and strives to provide him right. I also believe in the partnership with the town and how we can grow together. We truly appreciate what you do for us. And I thank you for the opportunity to enter into a renewed relationship. 
Thanks very much, Gail, um, and through you to the entire, uh, not just the ladies who you've uh, introduced uh, tonight in your presentation, but to the, the countless volunteers who, uh, uh, um, and sponsors actually, who uh, continually uh, support the initiatives and the programs that you bring uh, to our community. Are there questions uh, for Gail regarding her presentation, please? Councillor Cabezzi? Just a quick comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to Gail and the team at the station, I just wanted to say that um, the social media presence is very good. And I also thought they had um, creative like art kits that were available for sale yes. during COVID. So I just wanted to say congratulations to everybody. Um, it was very visible on social media. Thank you very much. We're, uh, we're trying to do what we can. They've got uh, spooky sacks um available <laughs> for right now and of course our online auction is happening uh it is live for bidding um till friday at 8 p.m it's all this week through uh, 32 auctions.com slash station arts 2021 and actually chris has the link so if you're looking for it and would like to check and see what's up for bids there is an absolutely gorgeous Adirondack chair and side table that Valerie Zato, a local artist, has painted a koi pond on, and it is pretty spectacular. So have a look. Gail, you're <laughs> upping my bids. Oh no! Did you did you bid on that? Steve? Oh yeah, no, I have a lot of fun on that. Well, remember, <laughs> okay, every anyways, penny right. goes no, to No, I'm to glad. Help us. I was going to ask. I'm glad you mentioned that and. Uh, um, Try to give it another plug before uh, we adjourn again tonight, because that's uh, um, one of the great things that the Station Arts did, not just for the um, the local talent, like the awe of the local talent, but it was also such a nice social, you know, uh, opportunity as a community to gather. But, and we um, certainly we hope that perhaps that. next year yeah. will be in person. So further questions for... Um, Ms. Connor. So there's a resolution um, that will uh, come, and I believe just a second. We're bouncing around here. So, Councillor Luciani, you have a resolution. Um, just before I leave that, though, uh, because in the report, and I don't want to, when we get to the report, we'll be done with the delegation. There is a figure in there. Um, that has a variance from the historical figure. Can you, from the perspective of Station Arts or the, uh, the Craft Guild, give any indication of, um, like we don't have the, the financial statement. It's an MOU, so they're not as relative if it was a grant application. Um, so the value for service or the value for the revenue, has that changed significantly? Um, well, I guess fully supportive. This isn't a, I'm just, uh, getting your, obvi obviously when you talk to the tourism side, COVID has, um, really done a number on that. So our visitor numbers are certainly down from there. Farmer's market has brought a lot more people in and they are checking, checking things out. So we've had a we've had a very good um, a very good uh, farmers market this year. Um, so I'm 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 thinking that numbers are um, are certainly getting better. I'm hoping that maybe even the Facebook, the social media, the Instagram, and what have you might be helping from that perspective. Um, I'm not sure if that really answers your 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 question um okay. i know uh our requests for funding um have basically remained unchanged for quite a few years uh but again um with what's happened with the fact that we've had an, a lot less through programming and what have you this is why we're making a bit of an appeal shall we say no, I understand. I'm supporting. It, it's a, it's a three-year. 
yes. agreement. Yes. And we I, when year. I get to, you know, we're, we're going to move right to now into the um, into the report. Well, there's a resolution. Uh, and then uh, when we get to the report, I'm just wondering if there are other ways to satisfy um, the real sincere requirements that uh, the, the, the station arts has. So, uh, Councillor Luciani, you have a resolution. Then I recognize Councillor Parker. Councillor Luciani, please. Yeah, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Esseltine that the council receives a delegation from Gail Connor, president of the Station Arts Center, regarding the memorandum of understanding with the town as information, and that this information be referred to item 14.7.1, staff report RCT 21-26 for consideration. Yeah, Councillor Parker, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was actually, I was trying to get in before we put the resolution so I could uh, ask Gail a question because uh, part of your conversation kind of piqued my interest. Um, there was funding available for tourism through the provincial government. Did the Station Arts Centre apply for any I, funding? I should have uh, made that comment and I, and I did not, um, I don't think I successfully did that part of it. We did, we were very fortunate. Not only did we apply for that, the SEBA loan and got that, but we also did apply for and received funding through the province, um, small business emergency. That was the one that uh, Premier Ford actually gave us two payments on. So we did receive, we have been fortunate. We have, um, We've been able to get a bit of PPE money back um, and a little bit of um, uh, hydro and what have you. Um, I have provided, we just got our, our audited statements. Um, our liaison, Chris Baird, does have the three years financial statements. Um, uh, part of the MOU is that we, we give you annual statements. So he has the most up-to-date, the new audited Bigger. So yes, Councillor Parker, we uh, we did avail ourselves of uh, of funding, and that was one reason we did not have to lay our staff off, and that way we could keep them. They worked in the background, worked at home, but kept that visibility with the community going, and uh, they they did sacks that they actually even dropped off on uh, porch drop offs and what have you. So. Um, you know, first year doing even things like that, um, you have sort of a, a nice little flow. If we had to do it going forward, I think it would increase, but um, we're sincerely hoping now that we can get back into, we did have our arts camps um, and that was at limited capacities, but that certainly was well received. And those students, uh, those, those participants, had to come for the full weeks because we could not have cohorts going in and out. It had to be one cohort for the whole the whole week. So the community has been very supportive of us. And as you can see by those numbers, those visitor numbers, um, it, it's increasing again and we've got more people. There's a gorgeous quilt exhibit in the Patnode Family Gallery right now. Uh, 35 quilts in there, and there are two quilts that are uh, uh, on silent auction uh, to fundraise for the station as well. It's the local in-house group, which I actually happen to uh, lead as well. So I've got a couple of quilts in there, and uh, uh, it's well worth a look. Okay, any questions from council to the resolution? We'll call the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? Resolution is carried. Uh, on behalf of council, uh, thanks again, Gail, for your presentation this evening. Thank you very much, Mayor Molnar and councillors. Good and night. We'll move to item 14.7.1. It's a staff report to Recreation, Culture, and Parks 21-26 uh, regarding the Memorandum of Understanding uh, recommendation. And I believe... 
move by myself and second by Danny. Uh, that report RCP 21 26 Station Arts 2022 to 2024 Memorandum of Understanding be received as information, and that Council approve the proposed Memorandum of Understanding as outlined within this report, and that an amount of 52000 be included in the 2022 Recreation, Culture, and Parks operating budget to provide the necessary funding as outlined in the MOU and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the agreement on behalf of the corporation. Thank you, Councillor Parker. Uh, discussion for members of council. Uh, Deputy Mayor, then Councillor Covesi, please. Just uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is this giving pre-budget approval to the 2022 budget? Pretty much. And I suggest that we. Um, it's it's actually getting, but it's a it's a document that needs to be signed. So yes, you need to be aware that by approving the resolution on the floor, you are committing a fifty two thousand dollar in twenty twenty two, but also through the signature on the agreement uh, for twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four as well. I'm uh, I'm uncomfortable with that, Mayor, because. Uh, not the amount and what I'm uncomfortable is the process that it should be taken up at budget time, which is up and coming. Um, I wonder if that should be separated. Resolution is on the floor. Council has every, you know, um, to amend, adopt, uh, do what, uh, uh, any other things. I have a couple of questions regarding that myself. So uh, do you want to put some thought into that? And we'll... I'm going to put some thought into okay. it and we'll see what other people. Okay. Councillor Govese, and I know uh, the author, Mr. Beard's uh, uh, ready to address any questions or concerns as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm kind of thinking of, along the same lines as the uh, deputy mayor. Um, like I'm, we don't really know what impact this has on the budget because we haven't seen it yet at this point. So I do have a question through you, Mr. Mayor, to um, Director Baird. When does this take into effect? Like I, I read, or when does the old MOU expire? I read that this one expires December 31st of I think 2024. So when does the current one expire? Thank you, Councillor, through the mayor. The current uh, MOU expires the end of this year, December 31st. And so this is really to avoid having to come back every year. Uh, we've made a recommendation that we do a three year. Um, so at least all, all the terms are outlined within the, uh, the memorandum of understanding. Uh, but maybe to provide Deputy Mayor uh, uh, Barris and, and Mr. Mayor, uh, just some additional clarification. Um, you're right. I think the intent here is to provide council the opportunity at the operating budget approval to make to look at everything that's been there staff certainly aren't looking at pre-budget approval the way we would for a larger capital project um, this basically it will be inserted into the draft operating um, the mayor and clerk being authorized to sign the agreement uh, this doesn't have to happen tomorrow it could be upon approval of the operating budget you don't want to tie your hands up you want to look at all of the uh, requests and the impact uh, for 2022 so i, I think uh we're very safe at that. Um, this is something that could, it would provide the authorization upon, upon approval, but the mayor and clerk perhaps would wait to sign it uh, until after the operating budget has been passed. So if I may- May I continue, please? Okay, th uh, thank you. So um, like it would appear that we do have some time and even, even if, if this is an issue that we would need to deal with at an early budget meeting, We've got several budget meetings lined up before Christmas. Um, so I, I would maybe kindly ask that the mover consider maybe deferring it to the budget. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Parker, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would agree with that. I think it should be this resolution should be deferred to um, the first budget meeting or the first or the a budget meeting in December. You, along with your duly recognized seconder, seconder. control the resolution on the floor. Um, 
Councillor Luciani, would you support uh, deferring this to um, a future budget meeting? Yeah, I've got no no issue with that. I mean, what we're basically looking at is the difference between the last approval and the new approval here, but uh, I've got no problem with it being uh, deferred. Um, Madam Clerk. Yes. But can we get something that the report, the, 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 I mean, RCP 2126 Station Art 22 to 24 MOU be received as information and referred to uh, 2022 budget deliberations? Yes, that's appropriate. All right. Are you fine, Councillor Parker? Yeah, that's good. It's more in that it gets received is what yeah. I want to ensure. Okay. Okay, um, Councillor Luciani, did you have any uh, follow-up comments to that, Mr. Baird? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, I think that's an excellent outcome. Uh, it just provides uh, the opportunity for Council to look at all the requests and how they will impact next year's budget. Uh, I think this is a very good, clear motion, and we can continue to move forward. Okay. Um, I didn't, uh, I'll support the, the resolution. Um, had some uh, questions along the same line, but I think uh, it, we need to leave here tonight looking forward to that deliberation uh, and do all of our best to continue to support uh, the excellent work of the, the staff, the volunteers uh, uh, of the Station Arts, because they really are a center of, uh, of excellence in, in our community. So uh, any other, it's now a, a resolution on the floor. Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That resolution is carried. I believe we're back to our final delegation. And Mr. Renault is patient. And I think this, when we get back here, we're going to continue on in the um, originally circulated order of our meeting. So welcome, Mr. Renault, who is the executive director of the Tilsonburg BIA. There's a correspondence uh, that was received, I believe, dated uh, uh, September 21st, 21, via a BIA board meeting. Um, Mr. Renault, you have comment, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wonder if the host could turn the video on for me. There we are. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Deputy Mayor, members of council, senior leadership team staff, and those following along at, home, along at home. The hospitality industry has been brought to its knees during this difficult period, beginning in March of 2020. This council has been very supportive of the BIA and its members in surviving and recovering from these impacts. Despite our collective best efforts, three of 21 downtown hospitality establishments have closed. In ongoing discussions with the remaining 18, only two, two of 18 report that sales are back at their pre-pandemic levels. Also of note, this sector has been negatively impacted by a labor shortage, supply chain disruptions, and higher costs for many food ingredients and supplies. All of these factors continue to put a great deal of pressure on these businesses. Even with today's provincial announcement with respect to the lifting of capacity restrictions for dine-in, eat-in restaurants, this is certainly not a panacea. Our restaurant members would still like to be able to offer outdoor dining throughout the winter period, as was demonstrated as being feasible and effective with Carriage Hall last winter season. For this reason, our Board of Management of the Downtown Tilsonburg BIA once again seeks assistance from Town Council in support of our hospitality industry. At a recent Board of Management meeting, the Board passed the following resolution and resolved that the Downtown Tilsonburg BIA Board of Management requests the Council of the Town of Tilsonburg to extend the current pop-up patio program until a permanent patio program is in place and respectfully request that town council adopt this policy in support of the local hospitality industry. And with that, Mr. Mayor, through you, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions or if there's any comments that I might be able to address. 
Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Renault. I believe uh, um, questions from members of council. Um, and I know that there's a, a resolution um, anticipated from council. Um, so if there's no questions, um, I did want to, um, where's the resolution that came? Uh, until a permanent patio program is in place. Uh, would you confirm that uh, the interest to, uh, and I support that, um, I have supported something like this for years to have, you know, just greater access to be a community um, and not all of it to, has to do with COVID. Some of it has to do with physical limitations, but, uh, uh, and finding programs that work. Are you familiar with the Cafe TO program? Say that again, Mr. Mayor. Cafe TO, it's Toronto's program. It's actually, and well, it's temporary now. Um, their committee that deals with this, including the mayor, uh, Tory, have also are on record now as suggesting they'd like to see a permanency uh, to some of these opportunities. And um, they have like a guidelines and a handbook and, and things to kind of streamline and, and all this. So I just kind of uh, uh, sharing that um, uh, as, a, as a potential means to uh, advancing this conversation uh, into the future. So um, not more a comment, I guess, than a question other than the awareness of it. We don't always have to reinvent things or we can find a way to tweak things locally. Um, and I guess what I would, uh, this is a resolution that's in front of us, a correspondence to resolution from the BIA, um, but you would confirm or are you in a position to confirm that uh, you would expect to see similar um, uh, equitable treatment for this type of program throughout the entire uh, area of the community? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, of course. And I would just like to step back uh, to your comment about what Toronto is doing. There is a lot of behind the scenes work taking place right now with the OBIAA best practice discussions. They have elevated uh, uh, requests from the BIAs, the 300 BIAs in Ontario, with the provincial government, the Alcohol and Gaming Commission, to try and make whatever program comes out more seamless so that it provides a framework that is easily adaptable for the various communities. There are differing, uh, I guess, interpretations from the AGCO as it relates to whether or not the outdoor patio has to be contiguous with the building. Is there a walkway allowed to be in between? Those sorts of things. So. The nuance of how that should be treated is being looked at from a global perspective in Ontario. And we're looking at through the OBIA in particular, how we can bring all these things together so that there is a more, I guess, structure put to it so that we can have, uh, we're at, no matter what jurisdiction you are in Ontario, that some of the same parameters, whether it's the Highway Traffic Act, it's Public Works Department, it's encroachment permits and so forth. What we have to this point has worked very well. It's just a matter of coming up with something more permanent. Good. Um, any final questions for Mr. Reno? Uh, Councillor Luciani, please. Uh, through Mr. Mayor to uh, Mr. Reno. Um, in regard to uh, some of the other areas that don't have patios, right now we've got uh, you've got patio furniture out, obviously across the town. Is there any consideration to leaving some of that out? Um, in support of the other ones as part of the patio program, or is that going to be put away anyways? Thank you very much uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. That's an excellent question. Uh, we will be leaving some out. There will be some benches left. Uh, there is a challenge with us keeping it, I guess, with the public works department, they want to have ease of access. So when they're doing the snow plowing on the sidewalk and so forth, that there's nothing in the way. But I think we've got a plan in place to be able to deal with that. It looks like as we progress with this, and if council says yes to extending this through the winter time, we will put resources behind making sure that this works. People like to sit outside, especially on a nice, bright, sunny day. It might be zero degrees out or minus five, but people are dressed for the winter. And if they're, you know, they can grab their Tim Hortons, they can grab something from special occasion cakes, from two girls in a cheese shop, whatever it may be. And people like it because they have, there's a place for them to sit, especially the seniors. Number one comment we get is, Fantastic. There's a place for me to sit down. So yes, we will be counselor. 
Great, thank you. Councillor Goezi, please. Thank you, I'm um, through you, Mr. Mayor to Mark. Um, have you had discussions with town staff about moving towards a permanent patio program? Have, have, have those conversations been initiated? Yep. So thank you for that question, Councillor Gavese, through you, Mr. Mayor. I have uh, briefly spoken with the town clerk on two or three occasions uh, to put our heads together about doing this. There's been, I guess, simple conversations had, but nothing that has been structured at this point. Uh, when I have brought this forward uh, to the building department, for example, since they're managing this through the encroachment permit process, they have been so busy and out of respect for that because of the building boom we're going through. Uh, we we're had a couple of other items that sort of fell off, I guess, the to-do list because of the, build, uh, the, bus the busyness of that department. So we will take that under advisement. That is a good question. And I'll make a follow-up so that Ms. Mybert and myself can meet hopefully within the next couple of weeks and then... Uh, put some effort behind a permanent policy. Members of council. Did you have any final summary comments, uh, Mr. Reno? I just, I'd like to thank council for all their support and the BIA and for our hospitality sector. Uh, it's still on life support. I mean, things have not returned to normal even with people getting their vaccinations there still are a lot of people that will not eat indoors they have a phobia i guess so they don't feel comfortable uh, eating inside so there are some structural changes in the hospitality business that i would just you know remind council that it's not business as normal still for these people just because there's restrictions being lifted today doesn't necessarily mean you're going to see more people eating out People are still cautious. Uh, there are people that have not been vaccinated yet and they're allowed to be outside. And there are people, other places that I've been, for example, in Kitchener where they've got massive patios outside and there's a lot of people that aren't vaccinated for whatever reason, not judging that. I'm just saying, I think if council supports this, it would be a, a wonderful, uh, I guess, uh, jolt in our arm to uh, help them get through the winter time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gobezi, you have a resolution, please. Yes, thank you. It's uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Parker that Council receive the delegation from Mark Renault, Executive Director of the Tilsonburg BIA, regarding a request to extend the pop up patio program as information, and that the current pop up patio program in place be extended until a permanent patio program is established. And if I just make, make a quick comment about that. So um, basically, essentially this is um, asking what the BIA has asked in the resolution and um, it keeps expiring. And um, it's, we have to keep like renewing it all the time. So this resolution really makes the not permanent pop-up patio program, um, at least stable in the interim until something's developed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm just gonna reread the second part. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for leading the resolution. This is a, um, there was a, a declared pecuniary interest from the circulated mover. Um, and the second part of that is after re receiving the information uh, as information and that the current pop-up patio program in place, a lot of it's the pop-up patio program in place, uh, be extended until a permanent patio program is established. Any further discussion from members of council? Uh, Madam Clerk, or excuse me, that's I think more uh, Director of Corporate Services. Yes, I'm here. Is there a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, when is the current extended temporary pop-up patio program expire? I believe the uh, the chief building official sent out an email for it to expire November the first. Okay. Um, the only other thing that I'm supportive of this, I'm supportive to you know, in a lot of things uh, that are about this. Um, I would encourage the mover to either ask there to be a permanent patio program 
and its staff bring back how that's going to be achieved. The, this reads that it's going to be the pop, current pop-up patio program will be in place uh, or extended, excuse me, until a permanent patio program is established, but there's no direction to establish a permanent patio program in this resolution. And I, as one, am committed to seeing that happen. And I think by extending the temporary until and giving direction that there will be, or at least a report on a permanent patio program, um, I would encourage that because that's, I think, uh, uh, something that uh, I'm prepared to support. Just a comment, I guess. Okay, so I can amend the motion. I think it, I think it does speak to moving towards. A well, permanent... with respect, though, and I'm trying to get you to. I'm That's trying... fine, Mr. Mayor. I'm going. To, I said I will amend it if uh, the mover, if the seconder would agree. So I will add a line, and that staff be directed to report back to council um, regarding the placement of a permanent patio program. I'll agree to that. Okay, thank. No. I'm... Thank you. Uh, to that uh, uh, expanded resolution for staff direction as well, um, is there any further questions from members of council? We'll call the question. All those in favor? Whose resolution is carried? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, Mar or Mr. Renault, appreciate that and continued uh, best efforts. Uh, uh, and, oh, just check your emails. <laughs> Exciting news, and I know you'll be very involved. Um, there's a uh, deputation, uh, very patiently waiting, I'd assume, uh, from the Museum Advisory Committee regarding uh, storage at Annadale House National Historic Site. Uh, welcome, Joan. There you are. Oh, you moved. Okay. How are you doing? I'm here. It's been an interesting two hours. <laughs> well, did I do something? We can hear you. We've seen the report. Did you just want to make summary comment on it? Or be prepared to answer any questions? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was told I was here to answer questions. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, Councillor, Councillor Govese, a resolution, please. Yes. I'm just trying to find, we've been all over the place here. I'm trying to where we are here. I'll read it if you, you want me to read it or? What page is it on? Uh, five of the, yeah, five. I got it. No, uh, it's not on page five. You want me to read it? I have it. Chair. Um, it's going to be moved by Councillor Covese and seconded by Councillor Parker. Resolved that Council receives the Museum Advisory Committee's recommendation requesting the removal of municipal records stored at the museum no later than December 31st, 2021 as information. You good with that, Councillor? Yes. Okay. Um, discussion. Uh, Deputy Mayor, please. Great resolution uh, from one side. The question is, where are they going to be moved to? Is there an answer to that? Uh, do I have to be recognized to speak? <laughs> you yeah, we're, we're, it is a delegation. So you go ahead, uh, okay. Joan, please. I, I know that the um, Oxford County Archives would take them. They told us that they have many towns tax rolls. <clears throat> the only downside might be that I'm not sure that you, I'm possibly the town would be giving up ownership of them to the Oxford County Archives, but they have storage offsite at Beachville. Um, the members of the public are still allowed to go in there and access the records for any 
reason that you might want to go in historic or otherwise. But if like we were desperate to, to find a place for the Tilsonburg News that we rescued. And thankfully the Oxford County Archives were thrilled to death to take them. And they have removed some from St. Paul's Church and will be removing the, the, the majority of them over the next month or so to the Beachville location. So they told me to tell you that they would also take the tax rolls if you so wanted. Yeah, thank you for that. Mr. Mayor, could I ask another question, please? To the Director of Corporate yeah, Services. Yeah, please continue. This is to Michelle, the Director of Corporate Services. Is this in any way at all uh, breaking legislation? Because it is uh, mandated that the town retain these records from what I understand. Uh, so are we breaking um, uh, any, any rules by not, uh, not retaining these within the ownership of the town? Yes, so the tax rules in particular are permanent records of the town. So we would need to uh, make sure that uh, um, they're in good good care and, and ownership. Uh, this is the first I've, I've heard about this opportunity. So we would need to explore that in some detail just to ensure that, uh, um, again, that those are our records and we're making sure that they're stored in a safe um, place and, and can be accessed as well. So to, I guess your short answer is we have not looked at that um, option as of yet. Okay, with that said, Mayor, I'm not, uh, I'm not comfortable with the resolution to, uh, uh, to, because it doesn't say where they're going to be stored. Uh, I believe that the Director of Corporate Services should be looking at that, but at least at the approval through her office to where they go. I remind just um, the resolution that is on the floor is to receive the resolution from the advisory committee as information. That's what this resolution says. It's as information. Any that, additional direction would require further amendment from council. With that, I'll support the resolution. Thank you. Um, Joan, or excuse me, Ms. Weston, did you have uh, comments? Well, the Museum Advisory Board is very concerned about the amount of space that these tax rolls were basically foisted on the museum and they're taking up a tremendous amount of space and the museum is at a crossroads with regards to space. They either need to blow, you know, blow out a room under the parking lot or something has to be done so that Patty is able to accept artifacts from the community and have a place to put them because at, the, at this moment she really doesn't. So it, it, it's becoming crucial to free up space at the museum. And the museum was never, like the tax rules were put there, not, not through the museum's wanting of them there. Let me just phrase it that way. So that's why the museum advisory committee is adamant that, like I would hope in your regards to your new town hall, I didn't hear anybody talk about a storage area for tax records and such. I think that needs to be built into your new town hall for sure. Get them out of, you know, have a place at your town hall to keep your town records. But anyway, until then, I don't know if you can find a space to stick them until you have your new town hall. That would be lovely. Councillor Parker, did you have a comment? No, I was just going to make comment that at this time it was to be received as information. There wasn't anything further, um, I, but I think Councillor Gildazi has comment. Councillor Russelkind, please, then Councillor Gildazi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was just because of a comment that um, uh, I put forward an amendment to the motion that would read that um, council receives the museum advisory committee's recommendation requesting the removal of municipal records start at the museum no later than December 31st, 2021. And that council directs staff to secure an alternate location prior to that date. Mayor Molnar, you're on mute. You can move a resolution that can be duly seconded that is your last sentence. 
what, whatever your last sentences was. Unless I hear from the mover that she, uh, the mover and second are comfortable with your line of thought. Councillor Govese, please. Um, I was going to amend the motion anyways with the approval. Uh, okay. Under. Okay, so um, we'll, the first part will read the same as to um, December 31st as information and that the clerk be directed to explore an option for the removal of the records from the museum and report back to council with an option or options. I'm fine with that. Um, yeah, sorry. No, that's very good. Um, and um, that um, appropriately will be on the floor as a mover and seconder. Um, Madam Clerk, did you get that? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, for further discussion, did you have any further comment, Councillor Esseltine? No, no. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, anything further for members? And I concur. I, I think that's the appropriate, there's an operational aspect to this. Uh, I fully respect the uh, advisory recommendation, uh, the eyes, the ears, the people who talked about station arts here earlier, you've got an entire omnibus of volunteers and people that are, are keeping that, uh, that uh, fantastic national historic site to, together. Um, so um, there's, uh, uh, without prejudicing, I'd suggest that there are some observational things. Uh, and some of those comments were included in the report. So um, I think supporting this amended resolution or the, uh, would uh, uh, speak to uh, um, the respect for the recommendation, but also um, ensuring that there's some go forward solution. So. And I think um, the committee member also suggested a couple of options. So um, we're not starting from scratch. Anything further? We'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? The resolution's carried. Uh, thanks very much, Joan. Thank you very much. I, we, uh, we appreciate it. And I, I'll be making my report to our committee on Thursday. And we will um, just leave this in moderate celebration tonight <laughs> so that we're more appropriately sharing community-wide the wonderful news uh, in the coming days. Thank that you. Was rather, that was rather cryptic, but I think you and members <laughs> of council know what we're doing. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Everybody, I hope you have a good rest of the night meeting. It sounds like a long one. Um, can I, oh. Are there any questions under COVID-19 uh, from members of council or senior leadership team? Uh, Councillor Parker, please. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Director Baird. Um, with the capacity limit changes that um, were announced on mm -hmm. Friday, are there going to be changes to some of the operations at the community center, such as uh, opening up more than one shower in the dressing rooms, um, time limits and such for people to enter the facility? Um, have we got that far with the new policies? To the mayor or councillor, uh, all of these are being uh, scrutinized uh, by our staff team and we hope to have uh, uh, a dispatch or certainly communicate out to our arena user groups uh, as soon as possible. Council, you'll also be provided a copy of that so you're well informed. Uh, we have a discussion first thing tomorrow at our, uh, our staff meeting. So I'm glad to share that with all of council uh, uh, by noon tomorrow. Anything further? I think it's, uh, thank you, Councillor Parker. Uh, I, I, as this council has been shared before and the uh, information from our, uh, uh, the province and the uh, Medical Officer of Health for Southwestern Public Health as of the 31st proof of COVID-19 vaccination will be required for anyone over the age of 12 who enters an indoor area of a sports or recreational fitness facility to participate in, coach, officiate, or watch organized sport. And that takes effect on the 31st. And there's certainly been fair a notification of that. And I thank Mr. Baird 
for uh, sharing us uh, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, and I know that it changes so rapidly. And excellent question, Councillor Parker. So tomorrow will be something else. And, but uh, the team are doing an excellent job. Um, just uh, reminding that uh, the, the, the virus does live among us. There are currently, as of noon today, 87 uh, positive cases across the region. Uh, and the town of Tilsonburg has act, uh, nine active cases. Uh, and I think importantly, the, today's date uh, was referenced very briefly by the, from the hospitality uh, sector from Mr. Renault, but uh, the occupancy and the access to a number of other uh, uh, opportunities in the province exists now for um, people that have had uh, two vaccinations plus a 14-day uh, period, uh, and then the proof of that same vaccination, which is again available at Ontario.ca with your health card number uh, and uh, date of birth, etc. And uh, it's now available uh, after the 15th. So now it's available. I know I have it on my phone is the uh, uh, the QR code uh, that you could uh, use as well. So uh, those things have, have been uh, well documented uh, uh, Tilsmerg.ca uh, slash uh, COVID-19, we think, uh, the communication team for that as well. Um, we will move to information items. Uh, there's uh, two pieces of uh, communication, uh, one from the Economic Development Office or uh, Council of Ontario and the other from uh, Minister of Finance. And um, I think it's important to share. Um, I don't think... Oh, Mr. Panchow, are you in attendance tonight? Yes, Mr. Uh, Mayor, I'm here. Thank well, you. No, no, I'm glad. I just wanted you to you know, bring your face up where you're. I, I wanted to, on behalf of uh, the, the actually correspondence that was addressed to myself and all of council, and it has been circulated to some uh, areas in the community. Uh, on behalf of EDCO, uh, the, the, informing us that Mr. Cephas Panchow, Development Commissioner for the Town of Tilsonburg, has been named one of Economic Development Council of Ontario's top 10 uh, development commissioners. So um, quite an impressive list, uh, quite an impressive uh, um, the letter as uh, signed by the CEO, Heather Lalon, but we wanted to make sure that it was on the public docket docket, excuse me, and you were recognized uh, uh, for that and congratulations. And you, the Mr. other information, yeah, and the, the uh, no, and the other is um, the OMPF uh, notification from the Ministry of Finance. So anything from either or from members uh, on either of those two pieces of correspondence? Uh, Deputy Mayor, you have a resolution, please. I do have a resolution moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Luciani. The council receives the correspondence from the Economic Developers Council of Ontario dated October 12, uh, 2021. And the correspondence from the Ministry of Finance dated October 21, 2021 as information. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, any further discussion? We'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, resolution is carried. We'll move to back into departmental reports. We've uh, made some advancements uh, on a couple of them already based on the delegations. We thank them again. Uh, under corporate services, uh, there's a report regarding COVID-19 workplace vaccination policy. Councillor Parker, you have that please? On mute. My apologies. <laughs> Usually I'm the one that's telling everybody else they're on mute. So uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Luciani, that the attached COVID-19 workplace vaccination policy be adopted. Discussion for members of council. Councillor Govesi, then Councillor Luciani, then Councillor Esseltine. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the um, clerk, I have a few questions. Um, 
how how many or what other municipalities within Oxford have adopted policies at this point? Um, I see that the report refers to the county or the township of Zora, um, but there weren't any other ones. That's a good question. I might actually defer that uh, to the CAO because I know that uh, Zora for sure um, adopted the policy. I know that there's been discussion with the with the CAOs. Uh, CAO Pratt, are you able to help me with this uh, question? Yeah, I think the chair of the council could raise The only two I'm aware of in the county is Oxford County and Zora. I'm not aware of any other at this juncture. Thank you. Um, so if I may continue through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to the clerk, what would be the timeline of this policy? Would it be effective immediately? Is there a grace period to allow for vaccination to occur? Yes, absolutely. So if council adopts the policy this evening, uh, then staff will take a look at a uh, procedure and some guidelines that will help guide uh, the movement towards compliance with the policy. So, um, and because um, the County of Oxford has been kind enough to share their policy, uh, we've also reached out to them to share their, their guidelines and their procedures as well. So there absolutely will be um, some time for us to communicate uh, the policy out to the team members and provide some uh, timelines so that people who may not be vaccinated now um, can absolutely have the opportunity to do so. Um, if I may continue through you, Mr. Mayor, to the clerk. Um, what if the, what if, the requirement for Vox passports go away. So, I mean, we all saw an announcement by Premier Ford on Friday, um, you know, who's, who have optimistically laid out a timeline that there actually may be a ticker tape, you know, at the end of the finish line that uh, we may be moving out of COVID. And I mean, some of that could start coming really in just a couple of months. So what would happen to a policy like this um, if that were to happen. So what we would do, um, like we have all during COVID, is take a look at uh, the guidance advice that's provided by the health unit. And so we would take that advice and take a look at the policies to determine what policies still need to be in force and effect and what policies uh, can then be um, essentially removed uh, from, from following uh, the policies and procedures. So again, we're, we're doing this policy because it's been directed by the, the health unit. So we're taking our cues from the health unit because they're the expert in, in this matter. Okay, thank you. Oh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the clerk. So are you said it was directed by the health unit. Was it directed by the health unit? Right. unit? It's encouraged. By the health unit or recommended by the health unit? It was encouraged and recommended, yes. Thank you. Recommended, okay. I wanted to clarify that. Um, I have a question about the definition of fully vaccinated. Um, could you please explain, um, basically it says that you receive your two shots and um, your two Health Canada approved shots. But then the um, thing that concerns me, it says, and recommended boosters. So I'm gonna question recommended boosters by who, and this is not mandated boosters, but recommended boosters, and does no one at this point has said that a vaccination, um, sorry, I'm just at a loss for words here, your passport with the QR code that we all have on our phones, but um, no one has said at this point that it's gonna expire without a booster. So um, I'm a little bit unclear as to what a recommended booster means in this context. Yes, uh, thank you. So the, the health unit has recommended boosters for certain segments of the population, um, those being over 70 and, and those with certain health conditions. So again, that's information that we have currently um, uh, with regard to what the health unit is saying. We're not sure at this point in time if um, the health unit is going to recommend that, that other sectors of uh, the population get the booster. And that's why we say it's suggested at this time. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Bird of the Clerk. However, no one at this point has said that your, you know, little QR code on your phone is going to expire without that booster. So, like, I mean, I just feel that this is a bit of an overreach. Um, it's a bit of speculation. And no one's mandating at this time a booster. Like, I mean, I can get if this policy said and um, you know any mandated boosters moving forward or if your vaccine passport expires like i fully understand that but i'm 
I'm, I guess I have to say that I think this is loosely worded. Uh, Further questions or comments from members of council? You've got more, Councillor Govese? Yes, I do. Thank you. That didn't sound like a question. That's so I didn't know if you're finished. Okay, it was a comment. Um, as far as testing goes, um, I'm not, there is a bit of a problem with regards to um, securing testing. So they have the travel test for $40 at, um, shoppers but the um to purchase them they're not readily available so i think that needs to be looked into um the one thing is and and i will be transparent to the public that i am vaccinated i believe in vaccinations i have all my vaccinations from childhood um but what i don't understand about these policies is that it assumes that only unvaccinated people can transmit covid and every day we see 33 percent um, of vaccinated people are transmitting COVID. Yes, the vaccine is supposed to protect you from ending up in the hospital. And if you've received the vaccine, you should be confident that it's going to work. That's what the health advisors are telling us. Um, but why would there never be any random testing of people who are vaccinated? Um, and this is where I feel that these policies fail because they don't take into account that actually everyone can spread it. So has any consideration been given in that regard? I think there was a question there. Has any consideration been given uh, to the transferability, transferability of vaccinated versus unvaccinated? And I think you heard the question in the policy. That's what we're dealing with. So um, as per directed uh, by council staff have taken the County of Oxford policy and we've, we've kind of tulsenbergized it. And uh, so as part of that, um, in talking to other municipalities, it's the, it's the health and welfare of the, of the team members that, that we're trying to protect here. So, um, and that's, that's obviously um, really important to, to the town, as you can imagine. So um, according to the health unit, again, um, having more vaccinated people is going to help us get through COVID. I, I understand what, what the question is. I'm, I'm not a, a medical officer of health. Um, I, I can't, I can't answer that, but all I can tell you is that has been um, the message from the, the health unit in terms of um, vaccinations and getting more people vaccinated. And I think that's what the policy helps to support is making sure that more of our team members um, are vaccinated. Thank you. And I, I would just comment back to you that, that uh, Premier Ford's announcement on Friday probably isn't going to encourage people that aren't vaccinated to get vaccinated when he's opened up a window of potentially moving towards a, uh, a, an end. There is an end game, I guess, let's put it that way. So, I mean, I kind of think that what he said might have been con contradictory to people wanting to rush out and, you know, stick their arm out and get vaccinated. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Luciani, please. Then I've got Councillor Russell time, then Councillor Parker. Uh, through Mr. Mayor to, I guess, CAO Pratt. Um, I guess I got a question regarding the provincial antigen uh, screening program. Are, is the town eligible to be part of that? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Luciani, uh, we did receive correspondence on that. Uh, it was forwarded to human resources, particular health and safety officer. So Michelle, are you able to answer that question? Council so, Luciani, are you talking about the, the funding that's available for some of those tests? Yeah, funding and basically the provision of, of rapid antigen tests by the province for use of, of small business and, and, and facilities under 150 people. Right. So um, our um, health and safety officer has uh, reached out to the Chamber of Commerce. They have access to these these testing units. And um, so we've we're hoping to secure a quantity of those um, subject to to funding that's available. If I may continue, then um, 
And it, Councilor Gulvezi raised a few good points in, in regard to the fact that uh, the, the new stuff that's coming out just now from, uh, from the province isn't going to, to, uh, to ba basically encourage anybody to move forward on this because there really is a finite time and, and a waiting time to get through. So from my point of it, um, we've got an obligation as a, as a town to basically support both, both sides, people vaccinated and unvaccinated. And I get the fact that a vaccination policy is needed. And a, and a policy, it could be as simple as we don't require people vaccinated or we do require people vaccinated and what the, what the terms are. So we do need to have something. And, and I think it's important that we proceed forward with this. And, I am, and speaking right now, I am fully in, in support of a vaccination policy. The, uh, the part that, that does kind of bother me a little bit, though, and, and, and regardless whether I'm vaccinated or not vaccinated, it, it comes to the point that you've got people that are employed, and the reason that we're going to be requesting them to be vaccinated and moving forward with the vaccination policy is to protect the employees we've got working as well as them and the general public that comes in. The, the question comes that these people that are hired and within the policy right now, it indicates that they're responsible for paying for the testing. And I'm just not 100% certain that that, if there's other provisions, especially with the uh, rapid antigen tests that are available from the province that are being provided for no charge to other town, uh, not town employees, but town business employees. I'm just wondering why, why, why we would make our employees have to pay for that because I, I really think that we should be able to find a way to facilitate somehow getting the answer to what we want, which is they don't have COVID before they come into work. Looking at the, uh, the Ontario Public Service policy, they've got a policy that, that basically requires anybody to be tested before they come into work. And regardless whether you work at home or, or whether you come into the office, if you're part of the Ontario Public Service, you're gonna have to be part of that vaccination policy. Um, for us to, to facilitate and move that forward, we'd have a hard time doing that because you're not going to have somebody at the town trying to test somebody before they come in. I don't think it's fair to the, the employees that are there to have to wait uh, for somebody else to, you know, to, to finish up their testing in order just to start work. So I'm, I'm in support of coming to work, having some type of test indicating that you know, you, you've been tested and that, that you're negative. So I guess where I'm going to with the long-winded uh, portion of that is if we can provide rapid antigen testing um, kits and there is provisions to have self-collection. And I'm just wondering why do we don't have those individuals that are not vaccinated trained as, as far as self self-collection and provide it. I think there's provisions that it has to be uh, reported to the ministry weekly, but that could be facilitated through the town. I've just, just thrown that out as another option. I'm just thinking that if I was an employee and that I've got a very short term and we're trying to, uh, we're trying to support all of our employees, including the ones unvaccinated, to get them through this short time period that we should be covering off or making available those testings. And I'm not too sure that's the popular policy that's across the province right now. But from my side, but I'm thinking that we've got good people. And if we don't do everything we can to keep these good people here and we lose them, the amount that it's going to cost us to try to get them back is going to surely offset any, any type of uh, savings we get by not providing some type of testing. Anyway, that's my that's my uh, my my take on it. So I guess my my question and, and where I'm going with it is, if we've got uh, provisions to get and provide those type of testings and make a provision to do it so that it can be done a little more seamlessly, then I think it's uh, it's something that we should do, and, and possibly that could be even an amendment to the the bottom of the uh, vaccination policy that uh, that the town of Tilsonburg cover the costs or at least till say January 31st till, and I'm not, I'm not even too sure how many people we don't have vaccine. I'm not even too sure what the cost would be on that. So this is just a far reach, but I'm just throwing it out there for, uh, for the support of the unvaccinated. And just as a final thought on that, if I was a vaccinated person and I'd be saying, well, why are you spending all this money on these unvaccinated people that's costing this money? My point would be there, we're paying it to protect you being safe in your workplace in spite of everything else with masking. Somewhere down right near the end, Councillor Luciani, was there a question? Because you said, I do have a question. Yeah, well, the, the question I is- I think, quote unquote, can we? 
I'm, no, I'm trying to. Uh, all sure right. So, that... so basically, I, I would suggest that maybe we put at the end of the vaccination policy be adopted that the town of Tilsmer cover the cost of, of employee uh, vaccinations as required with manager manager approval pre approval till January thirty first, twenty twenty two. Okay. Um, Councillor Esseltine, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to take your can we thing and feed it into my question slash comment here. So uh, this is pretty simple compared to the discussions we're having, but I noticed in um, the, um, the vaccination policy here that um, they have not been consistent in who the policy applies to and sometimes are related to the county of Oxford. So I wondered if we could be consistent in who's included in the policy statement and always use what it says in our motion from the last meeting that the town of Tilsonburg adopt a proof of vaccination policy for staff, council members, committee members, contractors, consultants, and students, because it says different things in different places and I think consistency is important in something like this. And uh, outside of that, I would support Councillor Luciani's um, comment about the town providing um, the uh, testing for staff, in particular for perhaps the first three months of the um, of, that we, we go through this. Um, and that would give us an opportunity to see what we're looking at in terms of numbers and how much it would cost the community. It would give us a time to encourage people who don't have a vaccine to get a vaccine. So I, I would support Councillor Lucy Annie's proposal there about the town paying for the testing for the first three months going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parker, please. For you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, CAO Pratt, um, we have policies in place now for health and safety for our employees. Um, have we had any cases of uh, COVID-19 amongst our town employees um, up until this point? To the mayor, to Councillor Parker, uh, I have been not notified. I have not been notified of any cases amongst our staff. Thank you. Um, follow up comment. With that being said, um, it seems as though the policies that we have in place are currently working. Um, there are high numbers of vaccinations through the community. Um, there are a number of staff members that aren't vaccinated. But if our policies are working, we've been going through this for a year and a half and we haven't had any cases. So why after a year and a half, are we trying to put a vaccination policy in place when the policies that are there are working? It, it, to me, it just seems like we are taking the, taking the position away from the people that are not vaccinated. We don't want to lose employees at the same time. I, I think that the policies that are in place are working. I think it's going to upset a certain number of team members that we have in the town. And we need to be careful of that because we don't want to lose some of our good employees. So thank you. Further questions? The resolution is on the floor. Councillor Rosehart, please, then the Deputy Mayor. That should pretty well give us round the bases. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Michelle. We're, um, and I agree with Mr. Parker. That was one of my questions as well. It's been almost two years, and the community within the complex has done a very good job of looking after everything there and the staff looking after themselves. And I'm sure they haven't sat home in their house. They've been out in the community shopping like everybody else. Uh, my question to Michelle is, where does the Privacy Act come in here for the people who are being tested and how are we going to keep each individual's personal private, whether they want to know whether they are or they aren't? Yes, good question. So we are obligated uh, to protect the, the privacy in terms of the any health information, uh, not just with COVID, but, but any health information. So there are protocols in place that other municipalities have adopted that we would uh, we would follow. Again, those are part of the, the policies and the guidelines that we would um, craft um, once or if council does adopt the, the vaccination policy. I just follow up, Mr. Mayor, I didn't really understand that. So say uh, somebody said, no, I don't want to reveal that to you, whether I have or not, what would the consequences be for that employee? 
right? So if, for example, they don't want to um, indicate that they don't have been vaccinated, then as the policy suggests, there would be some education that would be provided in terms of the benefits of being vaccinated, following which, um, again, if that information is not disclosed to us, then we would undertake uh, testing. You, you would what? I'm sorry, I didn't get the last, I didn't understand. Undertake the testing. Undertake the testing. Right, so if, if, if employees are not going to self-identify in terms of providing proof of vaccination status, then as per what the policy says, there's an educational component and then a testing component. And if they don't comply to that, what is the result? We hope that uh, uh, the you know the staff members would would comply um, with the with the policies and and it could be in fact that uh, testing would happen um, for a number of months or weeks. And just to follow up, Mr. Mayor, through you, and how often would the employee have to be tested? Again, those would be guidelines and uh, um, procedures that uh, would be put into place um, if the policy was adopted. What we're seeing normally and typically in municipalities is that testing is done uh, around twice a week. Anything further, Councillor Rosar? Oh, sorry, Mr. Mayor. No, thank you. Okay, thanks. Deputy Mayor, please. I have more, more comments than there were questions. I don't have a direct question. Would you welcome comments, Mayor? Oh, I think we've had a lot of comments. So <laughs> continue. Okay. Um, my concern, and if I have a question, my question would be, uh, we belong to the Southwest Public Health, which encourages uh, vaccinations. Uh, for employees. They also encourage vaccinations for uh, customers uh, when they go into certain businesses, although they're being, some of those are being lifted, but right now the vaccination policies are in effect. Um, my concern is, uh, is to support this policy. And the reason for that is uh, uh, I believe that if we check with our, our, uh, our people within the Southwest public health jurisdiction, which are some are not Oxford County areas, you'll find that many have adopted, and uh, but it all it's it's really up to us. We re we're not going to uh, follow others, but it's it's just nice to know that uh, if they're doing the right thing, they are. My my comments on this was I've had some dialogue with people who have uh, beaten illnesses, and they wear masks, and they're saying, for the love of goodness, please uh, adopt policies to keep us safe. Uh, we've 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 been on death's door. We've escaped it, and we really don't want to take any risks. For us to vaccinate or to insist on vaccination for our committee members, our council members, our uh, um, our staff is, uh, in my opinion, good leadership to help people in general to stay safe, which is the mandate of the province and everywhere to to stay safe as possible. A simple vaccination is there, and there are escape areas in this policy where people that simply can't have it uh, will be uh, will be protected. But um, it's uh, it's something that I, I just have to feel sorry for those who have uh, who have been through uh, uh, illnesses and and and, uh, and as I said, have escaped. And they just don't want to take any chances and any risk. And this would put them in a higher risk if we don't adopt this policy. Those are my comments. Thank you. I'm on mute. Um, resolution remains on the floor. Any further questions? The only question that I had then, uh, everyone's had their, uh, Councillor Luciani? And I have a few comments, but I, I'm the, uh, the only The only comment I had or, or, or question I had would be is, if it stands as it is, I take it we're gonna go through the logistics later of how people are gonna get vaccinated or get, uh, 
get their uh, test um, because that's right now I, I take it the only thing, uh, only options we've got basically would be uh, local drug stores or, or something like that. So I'm just, I mean, that, that's where I'm, I'm looking at before to say that, you know, what it would make sense if we can find some way to facilitate testing, but I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Well, just before we leave that, um, Madam Clerk, or excuse me, Director of Corporate Services, apologize. Um, under definitions, what is a test? Are we talking rapid antigen test? Are we talking a PCR test? It, it was the anti antigen uh, test that uh, most municipalities um, are pursuing because uh, there is funding available um, to get those uh, charge at the moment currently. So, I mean, the messaging from Councillor Luciani has merit relative to the, the opportunities are there. The chamber has been a, a distributor of that to other businesses locally. Um, uh, so um, I think the, the important thing, ironically, to remember is we've already approved that we will have a workplace vaccination policy. Uh, we did that on the 12th of October. Uh, that's been approved. Um, and it was proved with a second line that the counties recently be adapted. And we had the comments about the definition of adapted. Um, and that's now here tonight because council had the opportunity to review the county. And then we got a staff report that's acting on the council's direction from the 12th of October. And they brought back support for that resolution with two particular variances. It's a bad choice of word. Uh, under discussion. One is obtaining a test and the other is some amendments to not, uh, we deleted reference to long-term care and paramedic services as we don't have them in, in our uh, jurisdictional um, team members. Um, so uh, Councillor Luciani, is there, I'm just, you know, before we proceed with a vote that we've actually already had uh, on the 12th of October, um, is there anything that, uh, you would encourage that you would like to, or anyone else, I guess. But this is. I'm just uh, wondering whether uh, we don't do an amendment to the end of the uh, the motion, just indicating that the town does cover the costs and whether they cover it through getting them through free or through very minimal costing. Um, I, I just think uh, it would just put less of a burden on those that are required to have it. Um, I don't think it's a tough thing to get a, a vaccination needle and be done with it. But at the same point in time, those are personal choices. And I don't think we need to do anything more than that's already out there to, uh, to, to uh, make people, uh, you, you want to you want to make people uh feel part of, part of the organization, part, partly that they're still accepted and they want to be there and that the town supports them as an employer. So I, I think if we can do anything to facilitate that, it'd be good. So Councillor Parker, are you agreeable to an amendment? I am agreeable to an amendment. Um, what would you like the amendment to say? Uh, just maybe simply that the town of Tilsonburg cover the costs of employee COVID testing um, as required with manager approval until January 31st, 2022. I'll accept that. Adam, excuse me, deputy or director, did you get that? I did, thank you. And that could be the way it was worded, uh, interjected into the policy for a rollout. And I thought that last question was in result to the very first question, which was an excellent question from Councillor Govese relative to when does this actually take effect? And there's a bunch of other things that have to actually happen before anyone's potentially, you know, impacted or encouraged or faces to, um, the terms and conditions in, inside the policies, which I would totally concur with. Um, and I suggest I had that conversation with you earlier today and led that uh, charge at the County of Oxford as well about uh, providing notice. notice. 
Um, and in saying that, though, with the resolution, with, the, with that amendment, uh, we are talking um, rapid antigen testing. Is that what we're talking about? Councillor Luciani, Councillor Parker. From my understanding, yes. That is my understanding, too. We could just uh, insert one line, cover the cost of employee rapid antigen COVID testing as required. Good with that. Any further discussion? You're good? Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Anything further? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Who's? The resolution's carried. Um, proceeding through corporate services. Oh, did you get an amended resolution, Councillor Luciani? This is about the 2022 calendar dates. Not too sure whether it's amended or not. Um, I was going to encourage you to move and second that the recommendations contained in report uh, CS2130 be adopted. I'm good with that. That's far less, uh, <laughs> far shorter than what I've got minutes, here. You, yeah. Which is really what the resolution is with all the individual dates. Is there conversation from members of council? Um, the only comment I have is um, with the planning meetings, I would encourage that there's some level of, and I know it's tough because you, you're trying to get shovels and grounds and, and move, accelerate public planning meetings so that decisions are made rapidly, um, but with good public input. But we're beginning to have three, and it's not council necessarily, although it impacts council, um, we have three, we never used to have three meetings a month relative to council meetings. And that just brings in leadership team and management team and others. And, you know, in a meeting versus, you know, other activities, six or seven o'clock at night, uh, I would encourage that we at least keep an eye on that heading into 2022 uh, on the planning meetings side. So anything further? Call the question, all those in favor? Opposed, carried. Um, uh, Councilor Rosar, you have a resolution regarding uh, local governance week. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moved by myself, second by Council Lazy. That Council received report CS21-31 Local Government Week, October 18th to 22, 2021 as information. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Councilor. Um, discussion? Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That resolution is carried. Um, uh, Councilor Esseltine, you have a, a, a Resolution regarding a recommendation for an offer to purchase property in the Van Norman Innovation Park. I do, Mr. Mayor. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Luciani, that Council receives report EDM 21-29, offer to purchase lot 3B Van Norman Innovation Park, and that a bylaw be brought forward to authorize the mayor and clerk to enter into an agreement of purchase and sale with 1677123 Ontario, Inc. for the property described part of lot three in Van Norman Innovation Park and to be described by a new reference plan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Esseltine. Discussion? Call that question, all those in favor? Those resolutions carried. Uh, we move out of economic development. There's nothing on finance, fire and emergency services, but under operations and development, Councillor Luciani, you have a resolution regarding animal licensing service review. Yeah, move by myself and second by Deputy Mayor Barris that uh, report OPD 21-44, animal licensing service review, be received as information 
and that the town's animal licensing program is amended to remove cat licensing starting in 2022, which is option three in the report, and that the current animal control bylaw and rates and fees bylaw be amended to remove the requirement to license cats starting in, in 2022, and that staff be directed to bring a report to council in 2023 regarding the status of options and cancellation of the dog licensing program for 2024. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion? We'll call that Councillor uh, Councilor Parker, please. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I just want to do uh, thank Gino for um, bringing this report forward. Um, I look forward to future deliberations on it um, as I, I think that uh, we're moving in the right uh, direction. So thank you. Further questions to the report? Call the question. All those in favor? Oppose? The resolutions carry. Uh, echo that. Thanks, Mr. Van Hollen. Um, speaking of busy department, Councillor Esseltine, you have a resolution regarding a appointment of a building inspector. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Parker, that report OPD 21-47, building inspector appointment be received as information, and that a bylaw to appoint Justin White as a building official for the town of Tilsonburg be brought forward for council consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion? Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Resolutions carried. Uh, next on the agenda, there are two uh, related hangar land lease agreements. Uh, uh, Councillor Parker, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Gilvesi, the report OPD 21 48 hangar land lease agreement taxiway C 1 14 be received as information, and that Council authorizes the mayor and the clerk to sign the attached agreement to terminate the existing lease agreement for this hangar, and that a bylaw to execute a new land lease agreement for taxiway C 1 4 with 1467 246 Ontario Inc., and to repeal bylaw 3134. 3635 and 3746 be brought forward for council's consideration. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion? Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That resolution is carried. And the similar regarding taxiway G2 6. Councillor Govese, please. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Rosehart, the report OPD 21 49 hangar the land lease agreement taxiway G2 6 be received as information, and that Council authorizes the mayor and the clerk to sign the attached agreements to terminate the existing lease agreement for the hangar, and that a bylaw to execute a new land lease agreement for taxiway G2 6 with 1467 24 6 Ontario Inc and to repeal bylaw 3374 be brought forward for council's consideration. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Resolutions carried. Thank you. Uh, we move to a uh, report regarding the Urban County Road Maintenance Agreement. It's an amended agreement to add to County Road 20 or excuse me, North Street to the existing agreement. Deputy Mayor, you have that resolution, please. It's uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Parker, that report uh, OPD 21-50 Urban County Road Maintenance Agreement amendment be received as information and, and that the Chief Administrative Officer and Director of Operations and Development be authorized to execute the Urban County Road Maintenance Agreement amended dated um, October 5th, 2021, to include uh, County Road 20, which is North Street within the town limits as part of the agreement to be effective January 1st, 2022. Discussion from members of council? Um, one or two things for me, I, I, um, support of, of the concept uh, is there a demonstration that the funding is commensurate with the cost to do the work? Uh, 
Uh, thank you to you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, that is correct. The funding is, uh, is, uh, will be enough to complete the work required on this road. Okay, so we're making money. And one really quick low hanging fruit is uh, debris and litter pickup, dead carcass, dead animals on a county road that are picked up. They're included somewhere in the maintenance category. Is that correct? Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, just uh, the removal of the debris and, and litter pickup is included in the agreement. And that, under that category, are dead animals or carcasses? I don't think that is included in the wording of the agreement, but I can review um, the scope of work just to make the sure. The intent of the scope of the work. I, okay, thank you. Um, anything further? Call the question, all those in favor? Opposed, resolutions carried. Uh, recreation, culture and parks, we have uh, taken care of the uh, Station Arts MOU as amended, but we look forward to moving on that uh, early in the budgeting process. Councillor Esseltine, you have a, a a um, resolution regarding the award of the community center concession lease for the three years 21 through 2024. I do, Mr. Mayor, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Luciani, that report RCB 21 27, award of community center concession lease 2021 to 2024, be received as information and that council approve the proposal as submitted by Barris Butchery and Catering Inc for the term of November 1st, 2021 through April 30th, 2024 at an annualized rate of $4,500 plus applicable taxes and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the new lease agreement on behalf of the corporation. Thank you, Councillor Esseltine. Discussion? Uh, Deputy Mayor, then Councillor Rosehart, please. I just want to make it clear to the public, although my name is on that, uh, I no longer own the business. I have uh, left the business. I have no pecuniary interest whatsoever in this, and I will take part in the vote. Um, I, a lot of people don't know that. My name is simply uh, on there, but I have nothing to do with it for, uh, for personal gain. And Councillor Rosehart, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Oh, corporate office, sorry. Uh, to uh, Chris Barrett. Um, contract, I, I couldn't find a contract. I was just wondering what was in the contract for the concession stand. Uh, through the mayor, Councillor, um, the contract is very straightforward. It's the same one that has existed previously. It just outlines the uh, expectations, uh, the menu, and the uh, the pay structure that's outlined in the uh, the staff report. It's a fairly short uh, document. If council so wishes, I could provide you a copy of that for your perusal. Uh, and again, I'm glad to answer any other questions you might have. Just to follow up, there any further, Councillor Roser? Yes, to you, Mr. Yeah, please. Um, as the concession booth has nothing in it now, I don't have the contract and I don't know what, what the contract's going to read. Uh, who would look after the ductwork of the equipment that's there now? Uh, through the mayor, as I understand it, uh, all the basic uh, cleaning and maintenance is the requirement of the, uh, the, uh, the contractor. Uh, that the equipment, the, the uh, kitchen equipment that is there is available for their use and it is town owned. Uh, just a follow up on that, Mr. Mayor, means we were in the kitchen this weekend. The fryer had to be compensated and had to be plugged by one of your staff. Thank God they were there. I greatly appreciate it. It did work, but the fryer is uh, not really workable and not safe. And I'm wondering the, the ductwork, that would be the ductwork that for the, from the exhaust, would that be up to the contractor to have that maintained or would that be up to the town to have that maintained? Uh, through the mayor, I, uh, specifically uh, anything beyond just general maintenance and cleaning, uh, the equipment is owned by the town. And in that particular case, I'll have to look into it further, but uh, most likely uh, we would be repairing it, making sure that it meets all code requirements. 
uh, if the fryer needs to be repaired and or replaced, uh, that would be on the, the town's uh, uh, shoulders, as it were. Uh, just another follow-up. Would the uh, vending machines uh, be also uh, allowed to be with the contractor that's uh, doing the can canteen? Uh, through the mayor, I believe there there's a little bit of history with the uh, the vending machines. Uh, I believe we are at the end of a contract. Um, I know that we are going to revisit those uh, because of uh, the pandemic. There hasn't been a lot of activity until recently. So I'm not really sure the status of that, but I will look into uh, to that tomorrow and find out. But uh, the vending machines, to answer your question, Councillor, are not, uh, do not fall under the scope of this concession lease. Is it something that maybe we'd be looking at or not? Um, through the mayor, certainly we weren't planning to look at it at this point. Um, those vending machines are rather costly and they were on uh, uh, assignment from the supplier. Uh, if we are going to go into the vending machine business, we may want to take another look at that uh, in the future. But at this point, uh, it's not on our radar, but uh, I will certainly discuss it with my team. And if there's some recommendations that come out of that, uh, we would discuss them with you, uh, our council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anything further from members of council? And we'll call that question. All those in favor? Opposed, resolutions carried. Thank you. Um, excuse me. Uh, c c committee minutes. Councillor Luciani, you're getting all the long ones. Have you got a resolution there you'd like to share? Yeah, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Parker that uh, Council receives the Boundary Adjustment, uh, Adjustment Advisory Committee minutes dated September 21st, 2021. The Tilsburg 150 Advisory Committee Minutes dated October 5th and October 19th, 2021. The Town Hall Advisory Committee Minutes dated October 8th, 2021. The Economic Development Advisory Committee Minutes dated October 12th, 2021. The Tilsburg Dog Park Advisory Committee Minutes dated October 12th, 2021. The Cultural, Heritage and Special Awards Advisory Committee Minutes dated October 13th, 2021. And the Recreation and Sports Advisory Committee committee minutes dated October 13th, 2021, and the Affordable and Attainable Housing Advisory Committee minutes dated August 25th and September 22nd, uh, 2021, as information. Thank you, Councillor Luciani. Discussion for members of council or questions for clarity? I had a, a couple. Um, one may be addressed on a notice of motion because I thought there was an opportunity to deal with it this way, but I'll be patient. Um, 150 minutes. Um, the resolution says that Tilsburg 150 events be held during the dates of July 1st to July 3rd weekend as recommended by the advisory committee. Um, certainly respect the, the great work they're doing and the opportunity. Um, uh, I would hope that we're not precluding uh, year-long celebrations that may become available uh, in the community because we've dedicated three days uh, to what is uh, a year-long opportunity to celebrate 150 years. So I say that with all the positivity that I can, but and I know that event planning might be best in a two or three-day um, uh, kind of time frame, but uh, uh, I just wanted to be transparent about that. I was not at that meeting and I just wanted to be, uh, I respect everything they're doing, but I wanted to make sure that I had to um, at least share that. Um, Councillor Asseltine, probably there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just going to comment that the subsequent meeting following the one that said the um, 150 celebration would be on July 1st, 2nd and 3rd, the subsequent minutes of the next meeting said that they had narrowed it down to just July 1st. But my question with regard to that then is, um, is Turtle Fest happening in June in 2022? Does anybody know that? Because if it is, there's probably just a two week separation between the two. And I, and I wondered if that might be a concern for people that are involved in, in those organizing those activities. Um, does anyone want to know about Turtle Fest at all? 
I'm just thinking similar people would be involved in organizing both of them. And I wondered if that would be a problem. But. Well, Tur Tur Turtle Fest is usually on the 19th, plus or minus a couple of days uh, in June. Father's Day-ish weekend, I think. Um, uh, I don't know the direct answer to the plans for 2022, but you're talking about two significant events within really two weeks. But I think it's uh, important that whether that message is tonight is that there's a further identification on, uh, on um, you know, whether or not there is a tur turtle fest or... Um, that's a good point. Uh, Deputy Mayor? Being a member of the advisory committee, um, I will say this, that um, the advisory committee is not planning on doing anything in conjunction with Turtle Fest. I will say that it was discussed, possibly some portions of Canada Day they may contribute to, depending on where Canada Day will be going in, uh, in July of 2022. Uh, due to the COVID restrictions. We were not aware of that. We're still not aware of that. But to answer the mayor's first comment, uh, to keep the uh, the spirit of 150, it won't be just a one-day event or a one-month event. Uh, the committee has uh, has intentions of uh, making sure that it's, uh, it's well spelled out that uh, 2022 is the 150th anniversary of the town of Tulsa Marine Corporation. Okay. Anything further on any of those? There was a, um, I think we'll wait to round table on one with the help of Mr. Beard. And um, maybe the other one can best be addressed during the notice of motion. So anything further? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Resolution is carried. There was a notice of motion. Um, with a seconder, uh, it's on the agenda. Uh, Councillor Esseltine, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Rosehart uh, that the Culture, Heritage and Special Awards Committee recommends to Council that the tree-lined Broadway Street entrance to downtown Tulsaburg from Concession Street in the north to Venison Street in the south, bordered by stately heritage homes and age-old trees, be listed as a heritage conservation district in the town's municipal register of heritage properties. This mid-Broadway stretch of unique century homes and surrounding trees continues to welcome residents and visitors to both our, our town and our downtown in a grand way. And further that staff be directed to develop a plan to communicate this information to owners of homes whose addresses are attached to this report, as well as to the residents of the town of Tilsonburg as a new initiative to recognize and promote heritage properties in our town. This is a timely initiative to which the Heritage, Culture and Special Awards Committee has committed as we approach the 150th anniversary of the incorporation of the town. If I could continue, Mr. Mayor. Please. Okay, thank you. So um, with regard to this resolution, then we have also a list of 25 properties that are located between 258 Broadway and 303 Broadway that would be part of this resolution. And according to MPAC information, 22 of these homes or buildings were from the time period between 1850 and 1910, and 12 are from the 1800s alone. So uh, most of us are familiar with the Municipal Register of Cultural Heritage Properties. And currently the town's register has 14 heritage designated properties registered in it. According to the Ontario Heritage Act, it's essential for all heritage designated properties in the town to be in the register. The Ontario Heritage Act also allows for a municipality to list properties of cultural heritage value or interests that have not been designated in its municipal register. So at its June 9th, 2021 meeting, the Culture, Heritage and Special Awards Committee approved a motion to pursue a direction that adds listed non-designated properties to the town's register as a means of identifying properties that have cultural heritage value or interest in that community in addition to those that are currently designated. 
for both designated and or listing properties in the municipal register of heritage properties, there are two categories as outlined in the Ontario Heritage Act. One relates to individual properties, buildings and structures, and the other relates to heritage conservation districts, which can include a larger area or grouping of properties, buildings, cemeteries, natural features, cultural landscapes, or landscape features, ruins, archeological sites, or areas of archeological potential. So there's lots of opportunity there for the town to identify some of these things and work towards listing them in our directory. But the listing in the report in this resolution that we're considering today would be classified as a heritage conservation district. So information sheets provided by the province of Ontario and the Ontario Heritage Tour Kit provide reasons for listing properties in the register. So the, they relate to the culture heritage value and, uh, and it promotes knowledge and enhances understanding of the community's cultural heritage. Um, it's also a planning document that can be consulted by municipal decision makers when reviewing development proposals and permit applications. The register provides easily accessible information about cultural heritage properties for land use planners, property owners, developers, the tourism industry, educators, and the general public. The register provides interim protection for listed properties. So this is of importance in this area. So changes to the Ontario Building Code Act, which took effect in January 2006, brought new accelerated building permit review timeframes. For example, 10 days for a house or 20 days for a large, a large building, and these buildings could be demolished. Um, this would give the town little time to as access property spacing, to assess property spacing demolition. Amendments to the Ontario Heritage Act made in June 2006 addressed this issue. Owners of listed properties must give counsel of the municipality at least 60 days notice of their intention to demolish or remove a building or structure on the property. And that gives the town 60 days to um, assess whether they want to um, try and, and do something to protect, to save this property. So li listing non-designated properties in the register requires municipal council approval, normally given by resolution. In municipalities with a municipal heritage committee, council must consult with the committee before a non-designated property is added or removed from the register. For a non-designated property to be entered in the register, the only information required is a description sufficient to identify the property without the chance of confusion, such as the property's street address. A brief rationale should be provided explaining why it may be important to the community. Um, this was all included in the recommendation to council. Uh, a municipality is not required to consult with property owners of or the public to list non-designated properties in the register. However, notifying owners of the listing of properties is recommended. So this resolution, if approved, would allow for the first cultural heritage district or property to be listed in the town's register of cultural heritage properties. As the town approaches its 150th anniversary of incorporation, it's increasingly important to identify and recognize significant heritage properties in the community. Requests to list a property or district in the municipal register can come from property owners, municipal heritage committees, municipal heritage or planning staff, and local historical societies or residents association. So this motion then is to add um, a listing to the town's culture and heritage uh, direct register. And uh, if the committee continues in, in this direction, we will at some point have a fairly substantial register, which we lack now. And although there's opportunity for buildings to be designated, it doesn't seem to be something that people are interested in doing because of the, it's hard work and a lot of work to get a building designated and there are repercussions for having it designated. And we learned that with Ross Street with the increased insurance costs. So I think that this is a way to beef up our culture and heritage register of, of buildings, both uh, designated and uh, just listed. And it also with the particular property that we're talking about today, um, I know Councillor Rosehart is aware that there's, um, there's 
possibilities of development ha um, happening in that area. And uh, so if we do this now, we are um, giving council a little bit of leeway and a little bit of time to try and protect some of the heritage properties in that area. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I know that was very long-winded. Well, no, it, it's excellent. It was, long, you know, it was very informative. I don't know if I, uh, does anyone else have the information that you've just shared? You mentioned properties that are in the resolution. Yeah. The I don't have the, the committee. The committee has got the minutes. Yeah. The minutes are so thorough there. Yeah, but this information was presented to the committee. Um, the other thing that I not didn't- Not to council. Have, pardon me? But not, we don't have, I, I, I'm, listen, I'm supportive. I'm just trying to say, we don't have that information to assist us in our deliberations, do we? I, I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. I had, had tried to have this put on the agenda as um, a deputation from committee report in which we, case the report would have been circulated, but um, the clerk um, wasn't um, agreeable to that at this time. So um, I wanted okay. to get it put forward at this time because of the properties on Broadway um, that there may be some people looking to develop. And if this is forward okay. and passed- Which then we've you've it. mentioned twice, I'm gonna go to, Councillor Rosehart as the seconder. Then I got Councillor Parker. Everyone, um, the resolutions duly on the floor. Councillor Rosehart, please. Then Councillor Parker, Councillor Govese. Honey, the last statement that you made about the properties on Broadway should be removed from this motion. About the addresses? No, the properties that. Oh. You it's not oh it's not part of the motion that it, and it's not part of the report it was just a comment on my part oh, okay thank you um i have cp that would be councillor parker or um, mr. thanks mr mayor uh through to councillor esseltine i would have no problem supporting this in the future but i need to see documentation before um i'm willing to so maybe amend the resolution and ask for a report from staff or at least get the report that you guys received with it because as it's written right now i can't support it Um, Councillor Govese, then Councillor Lucien. Thank you. A um, couple comments. Um, maybe s similar to Councillor Parker. I think I actually think that this is a that there is merit to this initiative, um, but we don't have information. What concerns me is a bit of the process, and I know you had read that the property owners don't have to be informed, but we're a small town. Mm -hmm. right? We all know each other. I know a lot of property owners, and I find. I mean, I think it would be nice to reach out to them because if, if I'm sitting here as a property owner and I'm listening to this conversation, I'm like, okay, what's going to happen to my property? Am I going to be restricted? I won't be able, you know, have to use certain paint colors. Everyone right away thinks that all the historical attributes are really going to restrict what they can do with their home. So um, I'd be in, a, I'd probably be in a panic if. If, if it was one of my properties. So um, like Councillor Parker said, I think we need more information, clarification. And I also think we need to be upfront and communicate with the property owners in advance of just saying, here, you know, this is what it is, not to create a panic down Broadway. Okay, can I, can I respond, Mr. Mayor? Appreciate that. You're okay. good, Councillor. Okay. So part of the motion does ask that staff be directed to develop a plan to communicate this information. But the thing about listing a property, so designated properties, you're right. There, it, um, they can, they can, they would have to have changes to their building 
passed and approved by the town and things like that. But listed properties, no. The only thing that could happen here with a listed property is that the 60 day period of time um, before demolition could, ha could happen, before there could be a, a permit for demolition. There's, so it doesn't impact the roof or the, anything to do with people's individual homes because it's a district we're talking about and it's a listing, it's not a, um, a designation. That's a totally different thing. So th the reason that I thought it was important to get this out there was because of what's happening on Broadway right now. Um, and But it is included in the motion that staff be directed to develop a plan to communicate this information to homeowners, but also the information about they can put forward um, listings, uh, um, suggestions for listings in the Heritage Register. So this is a different thing than designating heritage properties. It, it's listing them because they're important to the community, um, but it, it doesn't have anything to do with, with what you can and what you can't do with your house. And I think it may be of importance to the people that live on Broadway who are proud of that area and the heritage homes there, that it, it gives them a little bit of confidence that the town is um, looking up to retain that area as a, as a uh, you know, an important historical and, and cultural area. If I may follow up, Mayor. Yeah. Um, I, like, I totally appreciate what you're saying. And I, I think maybe in part it was, it's like lack of information that mm -hmm. we didn't have the information in front of us. The public did not have the information. So um, there, there is going to have to be um, very good communication to the property owners so they don't because I mean I mean right away as a property owner I think I'd be in full panic mode well it's how it's communicated then isn't it that um, that is important mm -hmm. um, Councillor Luciani please I think Councillor Esseltine's answered majority of what I was uh, worried about there I just was looking for the long and short of how this was going to affect an actual property owner um, going forward, and, and, and I think it really it's just a listing as opposed to any uh, encumbrances on the house and what they can and can't do. Deputy Mayor, I'm only asking if you have any questions or comments because we've been through the channels here. No, pretty well been asked. Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I uh, head over heels two things I agree with Councillor Esseltine on. This is frustrating that this has had to come through a notice of motion. Because um, this is kind of low hanging fruit. Not that I want to continually add non business plan items, but this came from an advisory committee. Um, it's in the minutes. We, I was kind of debating earlier, I was going to say, can we, it's in the minutes, so you can give direction to bring from those minutes, receive those as information, and then at the end, um, bring a report back, you know, regarding that. I'm uh, fairly, not, you know, extensive, but, uh, you know, the Heritage Trust Act and, and other things, you know, it's been around for, for some of those. This isn't an easy, nor should it be an anticipated easy process and about public engagement, whether it's in or not, it's a, it's, it's in our, it's at the top of everything we should do is about strategic uh, uh, or um, our, our public engagement. And that's quite frankly, why we should be listening and acting on the recommendations of the advisory committee. So it's a bit of a conundrum. I'm uh, Councillor Esseltine, what's in it. I'm supporting your passion and your, I don't know anything about the time frame mechanisms and the urgency of it that have been part of the dissertation because I don't know anything about that. Like it's important for 60 days because someone might tear. I don't know anything about that. I do know about the heritage conservation districts and how the act works and the notification period and when it only starts to the clock starts ticking when council does, as you said, in your very first part of your comments, it only starts when council gives direction. That doesn't even mean it's happening. You start the process that will, you know, it, we went through this in a very similar thing relative to a BIA expanded district. 
there's a process that you had to, I'm not equating BIA districts with uh, heritage areas, but there's a process that um, uh, primarily the ministries uh, expect us and, and let, you know, regulate us to follow through on. So um, I would encourage that this is supported in principle and we get information that council can deliberate on and that you get, you get seven strong hands in the air saying this is the right thing to do and we move we move forward with it i as i said i think it would have been as easy as i know the issue relative to the let's be open transparent about the the report coming forward like just like there was with um, Heritage, uh, no, the Museum Advisory Committee earlier tonight. But we can't be held down by our own procedures if we're trying to advance certain things. And I, that's not a, any disrespect to, you know, on one hand, we want consistency. On the other hand, we don't want to be bogged down by red, you know, red, we're swimming in red tape just on getting advisory committees information to council that shouldn't happen but <laughs> as i said that um it should have it should not have taken a notice of motion on the other hand the notice of motion for me with absolute full respect doesn't address it the way it needs to be because i don't have the it, i i i've got to show some consistency that i don't know enough about it to put my hand up in support of the notice of motion. The closest I would get to it is to know that I'm not, I'm only starting a process that still has a long journey to go because the process is defined in the Heritage Act. Uh -oh. I, I know I didn't ask a question, they're just comments. I'm trying to be supportive of what you're doing, Councillor Esseltine. Um, but this is a definite ask. This is saying council will do the uh, concession street south on Broadway to Venison as a municipal heritage, uh, uh, heritage conservation district. And I applaud your research that you've done I don't have that research in front of me and I don't want to see this not, I don't want to see this not get traction if it's defeated. That's my point. So I'm being, that's just me. I'm one of seven. So anything further? Okay. The resolution um, I believe it was uh, moved by Councillor Asseltine. I know that I think it was Councillor Rosart who had seconded it. Um, you're firm on your resolution, Councillor Asseltine. I'm trying. I'm yeah. No, okay. I I, I I I'm just trying to think what my alternatives are then. Um, like I hate to go back to the committee and say, because the, the committee has prior to this made a motion about um, listing properties on the cultural heritage register and about pursuing that sort of thing this year, especially with the, um, um, the 150th anniversary. But so, so, the no, so I'm asking in the motion then for this particular area to be listed in, in the, in the um, directory. It's not a directory, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that staff be asked to develop a plan to communicate this um, to the community. Um, and I'm not here to, to debate it because I had my two minutes that I probably took three. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not what the resolution, it says once the re motion's approved, staff be directed to communicate. Okay. This, this council should be embracing the opportunity for communication coming towards us as well to ensure that we're making that the decision, not mm -hmm. that we're just telling what the decision was. Okay. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm, 
The other way to look at it is if, if we do sort of list one property, people get the idea of what we're trying to do because people can be involved in putting forward things for this cultural heritage um, record. Um, so it, sometimes you have to put forward one for people to get the idea of what you're looking to do um, for the community. Um, so, uh, I, um, I know question I'm through to, um, uh, and, and her responsibility as Madam Clerk, um, um, Michelle, I'm not prejudicing the vote of council. I'm looking for some guidance from the clerk on the, uh, not on the, on the, if, uh, Resolution's approved, it's there in front of you. If it's not approved, at the same meeting, can a resolution from the floor regarding this business, this business of the Heritage District be um, welcomed? So your question is, can the um, can the matter be reconsidered after the motion's defeated? Is that a need for reconsideration that it, once it's defeated, can someone say, I want more information about this? Well, my advice, our suggestion would be is if that's what tech council is looking for, um, staff can provide that information um, so that council has the information before you even vote on the recommendation. Okay. okay, I'm just trying to help. I, um, so what, what, kind of a, what kind of additional information are we looking for? Perhaps. No, I, okay. Um, Councillor Gavazzi, I think you had your hand up, then Councillor Parker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Like, I was just wondering if the mover might defer it and request staff to bring back information. I think the information that you provided when you talked about how it's gonna affect properties, that needs to be public. It needs to be on a public agenda so people can see it. Like I, I, I feel like we're not being transparent with the property owners um, by going and doing this and forming, informing them after. I feel that there should be two-way communication here. Um, and that that should be public. So I, my my thought is it should be deferred until we have more information. Like I said, I believe there's merit in this motion. I just think the process isn't correct. So we want more information then in, in terms of how the people in that area would respond to something like that? Is that what we're looking no. for? No, how they would be affected. So like more information on what designating that property. Okay, we're not designated, we're listing. Okay, so listing it, listing that property. How would the property owners be affected? Um, you know, what are the benefits of listing listing that? Um, I spoke to that, yeah. Okay. Well, I, well, I, actually, with respect to getting Councillor Govese or any other member of council, can with a seconder um, make a motion to defer. It doesn't just be, and I know you're trying, we're all trying to help. Um, Councillor Parker, please. Yeah, I, I was gonna follow suit with some of the comments that Councillor Gilvesi made. Like, I, I think we need to make sure that the public is aware, talking about it in the meeting is fine, but having it on paper so people can read it is, is something different. So we need to make sure that the, the public is communicated through that way and they can read through the policy and express their concerns. I, I would like to see this deferred um, to a future meeting with more information provided by council uh, or by staff with so that we can see the report itself instead of just hearing about it through the notice of motion through your your speaking i i'm in total agreement with it but without seeing the actual documentation i can't i can't support it the way that it's written if i had circulated but for a notice of motion you don't generally circulate information ahead of time yeah, do you like actually councillor Esseltine, you've done an excellent job because this i think we're we're skirting an issue that we've had a lot of notice of motions that have also not had a great deal of information behind it. so um council 
any member of council um, can make a motion to defer and then ask for more information. That's a prerogative of everyone. Um, uh, and the only alternative we have is the councillor has the mover and seconder. It remains on the floor, but we're getting very close to making a decision. <laughs> councillor Luciani, please. I'd like to put a motion to defer on the table. I'm looking for a seconder. The intent, Councillor Govazin, the intent is to have information. Can you, would you like to incorporate a date on that? Meaning the, is it the 9th of November? Is the next, yeah, 9th would be fine. Um, but deferred with, with additional information coming forward. Um, that's a resolution that is on the floor, does have precedence and the resolution is debatable. Now, um, are you understand just the text of the resolution, Madam Clerk? Yes, I do. Uh, we're speaking to the resolution to defer. That's the resolution that's on the floor, it does have precedent and is debatable. Councillor Rosehart, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to you, to Mr. Luciani. So is it, for more information to go to the residents, is that what we're asking for? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Rosehart, um, what I'm what I'm basically looking for is basically the stuff that Councilor Esseltine put forward, but in in a in a in a in a manner that I can read it and maybe regurgitate it a little bit better and and let it sink in. Hearing it came by pretty fast and trying to, to get it back in is, is pretty tough. So if we can have this deferred uh, with some type of information coming forward as far as where the effect is, what the effects are on the property owners, what the uh, the pluses and minuses of doing it, how would it would uh, enhance things within the town? I think those are all positive things to have for the uh, for the vote in the next, uh, the next time it's up. And a follow up to the seconder and that would be uh, Councillor Gavese. So would you also want the people on Broadway notified before this comes to council as notification or? I think the point is that that information that uh, Councillor Luciani alluded to um, puts it on a public agenda and it's not on a public agenda. So there's no opportunity. I don't know if, if at all possible, if there's 25 properties, then yes, maybe I think they should be aware of it. Maybe that should be communicated to them. Um, I, I, I just feel like we're doing this blind. It's, it's not on the agenda and uh, it needs to be, the information needs to be. I mean, if this, it's a positive, it's a positive thing. So maybe it should be communicated. Anything further? I think there that is a motion to defer and uh, um, wasn't included the date. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the clerk in that capacity probably has a fairly decent handle on the Ontario Heritage Act legislations and regulations, is, which is going to govern this. There's a flow chart that's going to say, that you make a decision, you have to do this, you have to make a notification, or you choose to through our own engagement policy to make notification. Um, so those are processes that are part and parcel of how um, this, and I mentioned it earlier, I apologize, the BIA, you know, expansion or, or reorganization, that's, there's processes that you have to follow. And I hope that we always take a step higher than the lowest common denominator, as we've done with our own uh, public engagement policy. So uh, I'm not writing the report. I think we've got uh, excellent uh, people in the clerk's department. They've heard counsel for a good part of the <laughs> latter part of the meeting. So I hope they've uh, taken some uh, credence from that. Councillor Esseltine, we'll end with you though. Oh, I was just going to say a lot of the information that's in here is from the Ontario Heritage Act, and it's all of uh, government documented stuff. So it's not stuff I made up out of my head. It's all from um, the, from the government people. No, I and I concur because I I have it. I've spent the afternoon kind of reading some of that, um, but I think others should have the opportunity to see that as well. Anyways, we're prepared to call that question. All those in favor 
Opposed? It's po or it's carried. Uh, it was five two. G G out of the way. I think we're approaching bylaws. Yes, we are. Councillor Glavesi, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Rosart that bylaw to amend bylaw 3295 ZN 7-21-13 and a bylaw to authorize an agreement of purchase and sale with 1677-123 uh, Ontario Inc. and a bylaw to appoint a building inspector for the town of Tilsonburg and a bylaw to execute a land lease agreement with 1467-246 Ontario Inc. and to repeal bylaws 3134-3635-3746. 36, and a bylaw to execute a land lease with 1467-246 Ontario Inc. and to repeal bylaw 3374 be read for a first, second, third and final reading and that the mayor and the clerk be and are hereby authorized to sign the same and place the corporate seal thereunto. Thanks, Councillor. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. It all take effect in the zoning bylaws. A twenty-day appeal period. Uh, um, the procedural uh, uh, or the confirmation of the meeting. Uh, Councilor Rosehart, you have that, please. Confirmation bylaw. Thank you. Moved by myself, second by Council Gavetti, that the bylaw 2021-108 to confirm to the proceedings of the council meeting held on October 25th, 2021, be read for the first, second, third, and final reading, and that the mayor and clerk be and are hereby authorized to sign the same and place the corporate seal thereunto. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rosar. Discussion? Councillor, oh. <laughs> Say that would have been a first, but go ahead. Uh, all those in favor? <laughs> Both that resolution's carried. Just any items of uh, community interest that uh, anyone like to bring up? Um, we'll, well, I'll just go across the top of my screen. Councillor Parker, Councillor Govese, Councillor Roser. Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, give a congratulations out to all the teams that participated in the Roy Beachy uh, Memorial Rep Tournament at the Community Centre over the weekend. Uh, Tilsonburg hosted Tilsonburg hosted um, 26 teams, uh, 23 from out of town, um, and it was an uh, overall successful weekend. Uh, special congratulations to the Midget Rep team from Tilsonburg who uh, won the championship 2-0. Uh, nothing. Um, so yeah, it was a good weekend overall. I spent pretty much uh, my whole weekend over there. <laughs> Uh, so it was uh, it was interesting. And uh, further, I'd like to ask uh, Director Reyes if he can give the public an update on the uh, construction projects. I know Council was uh, made aware of this happening, but if we could give the public an update, it would be appreciated. Uh, thank you for the question. Question and to you, Mr. Mayor. Um, at this point, we we have a couple of weeks delay due to the rain that is happening and and. And the weather is not cooperating for for capital projects that we have ongoing so at this point we have uh, anticipated two weeks delay so concession street and vienna road are anticipated to be completed by mid-november thank you thanks for that councillor parker um i think i'm working across excuse me councillor gobezi please well, Councillor Parker took the words out of my mouth. I was going to ask you a construction update, so we'll just move along. <laughs> well, let's just add in, while you're both excellent questions, Rolling Meadows, Rolling Meadows Phase 1 is 90% complete. Driveways are planned for tomorrow. That is tomorrow, the Tuesday. Sod to follow thereafter to be completed first week in November. And then Phase 2 is 70 percent complete curbs tomorrow to, uh, it will be finished a week or two after and then Councilor, uh, the, uh, Mr. Reyes's comments addressed Vienna Road and Concession Street. So very good. Right? We need some warm or some dry weather. Be nice. Uh, Councilor Rosart, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to the people in the community, when you're riding your bikes or you're walking across roads, please be careful. When you're crossing at the crosswalks, when you push the button, please stop and look. 
the lights change. People can't always stop at a on a dime. It's very dangerous. It's dark out there. People can't see people right now because of the weather. Please be careful. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anything further from members of council? Councillor Esseltine, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a notice then that um, the celebration for Tilsonburg Citizen of the Year is scheduled for Tuesday, November the 9th at the Carriage Hall starting at 5.30 p.m. And I, I think people who are um, uh, friends and co-workers and co-volunteers with uh, Joan Weston are invited to come and help celebrate that. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that, Councillor Russell. Any discussion or uh, anything further for members of council? Um, so, um, as of earlier tonight, finally, um, been approached um, oh, probably six weeks or so ago regarding an opportunity for Rogers Hometown Hockey to come to the town of Tilsonburg. Originally, it was going to be in 2022, so there was a great anticipation that it would be part of a, a wonderful 150th uh, celebration of the town. Um, just based on the transient nature uh, of the event uh, and some uh, uh, really health uh, situations in Western Canada, I think their scheduling has changed. Um, but I think uh, we're very excited to welcome Ron McLean, Tara Sloan, and the entire uh, Rogers Hometown Hockey uh, crew to our community from the 20th to the 22nd. So that's a Saturday, Sunday, with all the bells and whistles, and a Monday night hockey game between the Pittsburgh um, Penguins and the Winnipeg Jets. No, they're not playing here, but it's a uh, the uh, production team will be here uh, hosting the uh, the broadcast. So, um, Mr. Baird, um, we've been kind of sworn to secrecy or they were able to celebrate that a bit tonight and um, kind of uh, welcome any members of the community who are excited about participating and volunteering and helping out. And you've been instrumental in this. Uh, thank you. Can you share any additional information with us? Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'm, uh, I'm pleased to finally be able to make a public announcement as uh, have you and, and other council members uh, that the town of Tilsonburg has been officially uh, confirmed this evening uh, for um, the weekend of November 20, 21st. And as you mentioned, the live broadcast from Tilsonburg on Monday, November 22nd, that's the Sportsnet Rogers hometown hockey event. Um, the weekend is jam-packed, uh, full of all sorts of great things for uh, uh, families to enjoy, all in the spirit of hockey. It will all take place. Um, uh, we are working on a, a, a parade uh, down Broadway, and as well, the weekend will take place um, uh, the Saturday and Sunday at the community center on the east side. The large parking area will be taken over by the Rogers uh, Festival. Um, we do have fireworks planned for the evening of Saturday, November 20th. And uh, just uh, really, really exciting. I've had the pleasure of watching the, the last two weeks. Um, tonight they were in Lindsay, Ontario, and last week they were on air. And they really do a bang up job. And I know uh, Tilsonburg can be uh, incredibly proud to be shown uh, and promoted right across the country. So um, please be assured that uh, your staff are working really hard to make this come together, but we couldn't do it without uh, council support, um, the community, the service clubs, minor hockey. Everyone's going to be tapped to, uh, to participate and enjoy a really great weekend. Um, so we are going to have lots of announcements working with our communications people, and Rogers will hit the ground running here very shortly. Uh, so uh, lots, to, lots to do. Uh, November 20th will come around quickly, and of course, as you mentioned, the preparations for that event will start during the week prior. So lots of activity. We'll keep council informed completely and as well our community uh, to make this thing the best it can be. So with that, I'm glad to answer any questions. Uh, Councillor Russelltine, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to you and to Mr. Baird. Then I'm just wondering, you mentioned parade. What kind of a parade will it be on November 20th? 
Well, through the mayor counselor, we're not exactly sure at this point. Mm -hmm. I know uh, our fire chief is really excited to uh, show off some of his apparatus. Um, mm -hmm. I know the focus is generally on the minor hockey. So all okay. the teams, uh, not just in Tilsonburg, but area. We know that Tilsonburg serves a regional um, uh, community. And uh, we'll try to uh, really pull some, uh, some really fun things together. It's been a long time uh, since we've been able to, uh, to, to celebrate like this. Uh, of course, we'd be remiss not to mention that this is all very COVID uh, friendly. There are uh, protocols in place to keep everyone uh, safe uh, during the event. And um, uh, again, we'll, we'll hope for some good weather. We know that we know it won't be warm in November, but we know uh, it will be a little milder than uh, uh, midwinter, uh, which was, as, as some of council may recall, was the original proposal. So an accelerated date, but uh, I, I know I'm really proud of our team that we put together and uh, we're hoping for a bang up event. Sounds good. I, I'm not a big social media person, but I have can't help but notice the number of comments there have been about no Christmas parade in Tilsonburg this year. I wondered if you could put a Christmas element into a November 20th hockey parade. I don't know. Something to think about. Yeah, definitely, Councillor. Oh, uh, those are the type of, because it is uh, paint your town red. That The, the emphasis is on red. Um, as a matter of fact, well, I guess there's some subliminal um, Rogers in there, but it, it's paint your town red. And a lot of that in uh, uh, capital and, and items are things that they bring with them. And I think that's that partnership with the chamber, the BIA, local businesses and others. And I, I, I know Mr. Beard has a great team and we intend that that'll only be expanded upon now that you can actually talk about something. So, uh, and as I've uh, referenced to um, Rogers uh, liaisons and the people that approached to, uh, and, and at the onset, as you're talking to a, to a community that put an international air show on with eight to, eight days notice, um, uh, I've got full faith in in the, in the people of this community. So, anything else for round table? I think just building a bit upon Councillor Rosehart. Thanks, Councillor Rosehart, about the seasonal you know time changes and the uh, especially with uh, Halloween uh, coming up. And I guess just most importantly is that uh, we wish uh, the younger people in our community the best and, and hope that they stay safe through that, uh, um, what should be, you know, a fun, safe evening. At this point in time, uh, Councillor Esseltine, you have a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um... Okay, um, that the moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Parker, that the council meeting of October 25th, 21, 2021 be adjourned at 10 o'clock p.m. Thank you very much, Councillor Hesseltine. Discussion, all those in favor? Proposed resolution is carried. Just notice that our next regularly scheduled council meeting will be the 8th of November um, at six o'clock. And that there is a planning, a special date for a planning session on November the 1st. That meeting starts at 4.30, I believe. And of, uh, I don't uh, have access to the entire agenda but there is a application that is intended to be introduced to the public uh, for a proposed official plan amendment, draft plan of subdivision and zone change at uh, property known uh, as 101 John Pound Road here in Tilsonburg. Um, and then it'll be very similar to all the other public meetings that we've had, that there would be a virtual meeting, but access is, is available. Please contact either the planning department or the clerk's office for information on that. And we stand adjourned and thanks very much and please stay safe. Good night.